how we can configure helm and tiller component so we execute commands to deploy the tiller component inside the kubernetes cluster okay once it is done then from sitting here we can able to deploy the applications on this cluster so as i said this will be the jenkins server in the real time so that in the jenkins if we configure in the jenkins pipeline or maybe <clears throat> uh, jenkins uh, freestyle project okay so we need to configure the job the deployment job then it will go and deploy that part we'll discuss later and how we need to discuss that or it can be any normal machine also linux machine or local laptop for example testing purpose you want to do like uh, see for the first time itself helm chart is not going to be deployed properly maybe um, you are doing a lot of changes to that so from your laptop also you can have that helm installed and um, you can deploy and you can test whether everything is working fine and then you can go and configure cd job because always you will not go to the jenkins and execute the job and test it whether all the components are working fine whether your application is coming online or not this testing need to be done for the first time right so we, we don't want to go always to the jenkins server from your local also for example config maps so you multiple times you are editing config maps and you are again deploying the application but connect and uh, application is not starting and it's trying to connect some uh, different database or different service but it cannot able to reach again you do some modification in the config maps again you deploy so i do it from my local machine first once everything is done whatever the modifications has been done in my local on uh, the helm chart that i'll push the github okay or bitbucket and uh, wherever like whenever jenkins clone the github okay so that repo i will to that repo i will push the code what are the changes i have done from my local and then i'll try to execute the jenkins the final stage okay so whenever you want to deploy we will schedule the job so this way we'll do it so as i said yesterday helm charts when we are talking about helm chart, till now we were executing the commands for deploying any application or creating anything okay so basically here uh, helm charts contains yaml files so yaml files is an uh, yet some people say it's a markup language and some people say it's not markup language but it's another format syntax format will be there like how we have uh, json is there html is there html is not a programming language just syntax format same way json is also syntax some syntax will be followed in the json right same way like xml is there and uh, this is an yml so compared to json xml html this yaml file is very easy to understand and easy to write also it's not complicated like remaining uh, markup languages so it's very very easy to write it okay i think you guys already uh, done familiar with the ansible in ansible also you write playbooks so there you are going to uh, use yaml only so here in the kubernetes when you are using yaml here you are going to use as i said the uh, in the initial days the api four things are important api version and um, kind specifications so these are important so let me power on these machines yesterday i created one sample helm chart with helm create so we'll discuss the directory structure what each file contains and how you need to place the files inside that we'll discuss now. so this concept this architecture helm on client side tiller is on server side is in two version in three version there will be no server side component tiller will
this is the one and one more machine I need to power on um, the, where I installed a pillar that is Linux this is the name of that machine we power on Okay, as of now we don't see anyone except one NFS client provisioner. This is a Linux machine, one of the Linux machine. So let me log into this because we installed a Helm inside this machine. Uh, hi Pravin. Yes. Uh, in this machine, install Tiller and Helm also installed in this machine. Not Tiller. As I said, only Helm. Okay. Tiller installed on installed Kubernetes. Tiller. Okay. Yes. So yeah. when I said we need to execute this command, so then what it will do? It will go and deploy the application inside the. Uh, the stiller component inside the cluster. Okay. Actually, uh, facing issue is patching configuration yesterday. So. Okay. So you can ping the screenshots in the WhatsApp group so that I can help you, okay? Sure, Kevin. So, We can do, I think, helm reset is a command to reset everything. Um, there are still two deployed releases. List. Okay, Jenkins. So if you want to reset means if it is not working fine, then you can do Helm reset. So whatever the components it got deployed like uh, the cube uh, Tiller component if you see get pods iPhone and cube iPhone system This pod will get deleted. Okay, so this bot pod get created with the help of this deployment Means whenever we execute that command so this deployment will be deployed in the cluster whenever we execute so it is saying um, i actually let me tell me delete mm. see if you see helm reset Tiller, the Helm server side component has been uninstalled. Now, if I check here, the deployment, see there is no Tiller component, okay? So what are the steps I provided here? So up to here it will work, but now why I've deleted because I just want to show you to execute this command. Yesterday I did not execute this command. We can do all these things, download and install the Helm and create uh, this uh, cluster role binding and cluster role for tiller 
and then uh, copy this uh, config file and then we need to execute this command so when i execute this command let me execute it It's completely deleted. Hmm. Now what I need to do? Just let me install this one. then from scratch i'm doing it again okay i missed this command ch more so install and by default it went to the usr local bin the helm command is available over there and now this uh, these are server side okay it's cute so okay and uh, now what i'll do i'll execute this one And let me see whether uh, dot cube is there here or is it also got deleted yes it is available so no need to copy because when i'm executing this command helm in it it will go and talk to the cluster one cluster so if you don't copy the config file inside your local then it will not able to deploy this stiller component on the cluster so that's why we need to copy it so now we can able to execute this successfully completed if you see tiller has been installed into your kubernetes cluster so this message you need to get so now if i go here where i was doing all these things what i'm doing on the cluster side that's why this is a problem I need to do here that is what i'm checking why package was not available mistakenly i was executing these commands on the cluster itself on the master server not on the client linux machine okay there is no tiller component so here right now i'm in the linux client machine so let me so helm is there but only thing is this all steps again i don't need to do only i need to execute this command once again okay because this helm already is installed and uh, if you see helm version so client means this present machine version is 2.14.1 could not able to find the server because it's not connecting to any cluster right now that's why it is not showing any version for you so now what you need to do this command if you execute tiller has been installed into your kubernetes cluster okay so now i'll go to the cluster and if you see 13 seconds ago it started running okay and now the deployment it is going to deploy the pod so how it is deploying the pod with the type of deployment okay if you tell get deployment if you see this one sorry in the cube name system namespace so this is a name so we already discussed daemon set stateful set and uh, the type deployment so if you want to see kubectl get 
let ds means daemon set any daemon sets are available stateful set there is no resource only it's showing deployment because this stiller pod has been deployed with the type of deployment okay so that's why we can able to see the stiller deploy and now if you see helm version again here now server version also it is showing 2.14.1 so most of the time um, whenever you're trying to contact maybe due to the helm version difference also sometimes you cannot able to deploy the applications maybe your client version is low and your server version is high that time also sometimes you cannot able to deploy the applications so you need to make sure both are in almost in the equal compatible versions okay so this is how we can able to configure your uh, any client machine with the helm and automatically when you execute this command tiller component got deployed so whenever you deploy any applications from here so it will go and deploy inside this machine okay i will show you to deploy some sample applications before that i'd like to discuss the uh, uh, helm chart uh, directory structure okay i'll go into my charts yesterday i created one helm chart so helm create this is a command to create helm chart so when i go inside this a b c e e this is a chart name so these are the files has been created okay so now this is charts directory so if you go inside this charts directory you can't see anything this chart directory is for um any dependency charts maybe this helm chart is dependent on some other uh, helm charts then those things you need to define here so that first they will be executed and then this present chart will be executed so that's why this is a charts directory will be there and uh, chart dot yaml inside the charts directory so this is the metadata information of your chart what is the version of your chart like sometimes we will modify the uh, version of the chart also like uh, see in real time organization let's say forget about devops you might be in any domain you might be creating some document okay for some activity after three months the process has been changed in that activity doing the activity you might be added some another step so what you are going to do in the document you will add that step but in the first page of index page you are going to update the version means what changes you have done now that will be you mentioned inside the index page the version 1.1 and then you will mention okay this has the changes has been done right again someone else has been modified the same document after some time maybe some other new steps has been added or maybe maybe existing step might be deleted removed from the documentation those things need to be updated because we need to know what changes has been done from the previous document and present document same way here also the helm charts we may modify them okay so every time it cannot be the same version so we need to modify the versions so 1.0 1.1 1.2 like that we can modify the versions okay so that we can see the difference of okay. and all these versions you can save inside the um, repositories so as i said to store the same repositories also we'll use uh, um, in cloud we use acr gcr there we can store the helm charts also okay or else you can store them in the github or maybe your source code management you can save them so this is the metadata the charts.yaml file and templates important directories templates so here we are going to place all the relevant yaml files to deploy your microservice so the first thing is for your deployment your microservice maybe as i said 90 percent use deployment type okay so 
here that's why by default they also mentioned deployment.yaml file if you want you can rename this you can change the name okay and uh, these are some sample files okay so what you need to do you need to modify this so more deployment.yaml file you need to modify accordingly like what name you want to give labels how many replicas selector okay uh, template like how we were seeing the previously the deployment file so that all these things you can mention here so here if you see as of now this helm chart is written in little bit of go language format okay so if you know go language then you can write in this format but in real time mostly we don't choose this format but uh, not with the go language format what we'll do we'll give completely with the variables okay so variables means what here whatever the values we are having this is key value pair right this is key and this is a value so here if you go out of this templates directory you can see one values.yaml file so inside this values.yaml file we are going to give values for all the files in the templates if you have 10 20 30 uh, files to create some components for every component you can give the values inside this values.yaml file so if you see forget about wherever this include is there that almost belongs to little bit of go language forget about it so here if you see dot values dot replica count and uh, dot values image full secrets and uh, dot values this image location dot values dot image dot repository dot values dot image dot tag okay so this way we can write this is simple variable concept like those are having knowledge on scripting what you'll do variable so in the script you will define uh, variables right or if you guys are aware about ansible ansible also same thing when you are creating role so it will pick up variables from some file okay whenever you create a role it will create some structure a lot of handlers file will be there task file will be there so main.yaml file will be there and it will pick up the values from the different files. same way here also it will pick up from the values this we need to do automation compulsory why because um, always we no need to come to these files and need to modify if you modify in the values.yaml file that's enough okay means here we are asking it to go and check the values from the values.yaml file not only this deployment file even if you take the service file so in real time we should not hard code in this files even in the service.yaml file what is taking dot values dot service dot type so let me open this um, values dot yaml file so what it is there replica count is one image repository nginx default values has been there tag stable okay and image full secrets and if you see service this is for the service dot yaml file service dot yaml file will check here okay so okay this is related to the service right and uh, if you see in the specs field these two lines i'll explain you now type what is the service type whether it's a load balancer or a node port or a cluster ip always you need to we are telling that go and check in the values file so that's why we need to give this value dot values and in this values file so this is the service okay service and type and type so it is getting the values means cluster ip okay and uh, what is the port you are going to assign in this if you see value same service port okay this way for example here <coughs> so under the service these two are there so that's why service dot type service dot port 
suppose if i mention this way okay then what i need to give here type this way we need to give it here very simple service under service type and under type it's port so this way we need to give okay so whenever you are giving the values because in real time you need to give all the values inside your values.yaml file so why i am starting with service because this is a starting point service is not under any other field okay so service is a starting point and even here image is also starting point replica count is also starting point it is not under any other but if you see under image we can see these two repository and tag so let me open the uh deployment so if you see here image image also and uh, if i go to values.yaml file this is in the values.yaml file it's very simple easy to write okay so why image is having in this way by default dot values you need to queue so it will go and check in the values.yaml file image dot repository okay so image under image repository is there and for tags values dot image dot tag because tag is not under repository tag is under image so that's why image dot tag so image pool policy this is image pool policy what is the value we are giving dot values dot image this one dot full policy okay so this way we will give all the values of your service.yaml file deployment file any other files you are adding inside the helm chart all those charts values we are going to give so we no need to use any uh, go language format so so go language format means so this include okay wherever include is coming that will be little bit of go language so we no need to worry about that so because everyone doesn't know go language right so only we will give same way what we are i'm going to give in case method data name you want to give you just go there <coughs> and uh, give dot values here and give some name over there okay like for example in the values.yaml file i'll give this way metadata name equal to some metadata name app dot zero one something like this so in the values.yaml i can give something like this dot values metadata dot name where i will give under this here so this way we can give. we can remove this and we can give only values should be picked up from the values.yaml file compulsory we need to do this we cannot hard code directly inside this each and every file okay so that's why values.yaml file is required and uh, inside the templates if you see some more files those are examples samples files will be there and if you see this helpers.tpl this file if you know uh, go language then you can understand this one okay so everything is defined over here related to that go language concept so here it is defined we can ignore if you are not using go language so this is how helm chart looks like so here we are going to place all the files so which are not required you can delete that this notes is not required you can delete it and if you are not using an ingress controller you can delete all these files and you can create new files like you can name it your app.deployment.yaml file and your app.service.yaml file and if it required config maps and uh, secrets or uh, physical volumes physical volume claims anything what to run that particular microservice what are the application what are the Kubernetes components are required. You need to create a YAML file of that component and then you need to deploy. So for the first time you might face some issues, maybe some mistake in the your uh, any file. Because here main important we need to take care is space. Only the complicated thing in this YAML file is space. If you give anywhere space x1 extra 
are not given properly space then it will give an error so that you need to take care okay so after that you will deploy the application okay so now what i am going to do i am going to deploy some sample applications sample applications means what um as i said helm search let's say engineers means in the stable repository we have nginx also nginx ingress is showing uh, nginx web server it is not showing mm -hmm. let me search helm search mysql or else helm search jenkins okay so jenkins is there so let me install jenkins deployment so what it will do it's same like yum it will pick up the repository from the stable repo of kubernetes from there it will pick up this helm chart and this helm chart it is going to deploy inside the kubernetes cluster okay so that it will do so now what i am going to do i will deploy this one helm install uh, the chart name what is the name you want to give for this deployment okay jenkins master slave this is the name i want to give and if you want to deploy it on specific namespace then give hyphen hyphen namespace that namespace name you need to give okay so as of now i want to deploy it on default namespace see it got deployed and what are the components it gets created everything you can see here the name what you gave to this deployment and in the namespace default status deployed and it contains config maps okay and these are the config maps has been created and the deployment if you see this is deployment type so it's getting created persistent volume claim also got created pvc one pvc got created and uh, this is a pod they are getting created and uh, two roles has been created these are the roles and role binding also created one secret created and two services so if you remember this is a service cluster ip which means i cannot able to access this jenkins now from the external world internally only i can able to access but externally i cannot able to access so what i need to do i need to change the cluster ip to node port okay then i can able to access it by using the node ip as of now i cannot do that i can change it later on so just i want to show you the deployment so if i go to the master so it is showing in a pending state why it is showing in a pending state because it is expecting a volume okay it's created a pvc this one pvc is physical volume claim is not created so without volume this pod is not coming online how you can know so you just click this pod kubectl describe a pod and the pod name you can see why the pods are in pending state or in the error state okay pod has unbound immediate persistent volume claims okay so that's why due to of unavailability of pvc it cannot able to come online so what i'll do uh, This is my NFS dynamic provisioner. So this is how we create. And if you see here in the um, Helm, 
client location if you check helm list you can able to see what are the deployments you have done here okay you see here deployed and this is a chart version and update okay so whenever you want to delete this deployment help delete if and uh, delete the deployment name whatever the name you have given hyphen hyphen purge why we need to give purge because if you don't give purge it gets deleted but it will not get deleted from the complete metadata so again if you are trying to deploy with the same name it gives you error that already deployment is available with this name so to delete it from completely then we need to give purge so it will get deleted okay so lot of comments are also available so let me try few more comments helm comments you can roll back also for example now i have deployed now i want to uh, update something maybe i have done some changes in the helm chart and again i redeployed so it will change the version okay and later on i decided okay that is not correct then you can roll back to the previous version also in the helm so we can use helm uh, package also right now i was i created some uh, chart right so this one helm package a b c d okay this will create successfully packaged and this package we will push to the remote repository and whatever is in the chart.yaml file the version with that version it will create so that okay again we push it again we do any modification to this chart we need to change the metadata value maybe 1.0 2.0 and again we need to create this uh, prepare the package and we need to push it to the remote repository okay so this way we can create the package we call it as a package So the command package a chart into a version chart archive file if a path is given this way look at the path for a chart so version chart archives are used by helm package repositories so this package you can store so helm list iphone all life and namespaces means in different namespaces if you are deploying through this helm then it will show all the deployments which was done on all the namespaces so hmm. this doesn't have much comments basically one more command is also there like uh, we are accessing like helm search let's say nginx no need to download it locally so without downloading locally also if you if i want to check the values.yaml file of this specific chart you can use helm inspect values.yaml of this chart chart
I'll do one thing. I'll collect that uh, all the commands and I'll uh, show you regarding this Helm. So I never tried of creating a, a Helm repository outside the cloud because uh, we have an option. I was working with uh, Azure. So in the Azure, we have a concept called ACR, Azure Container Registry, where you can store Docker images and you can store Helm charts also. Okay. So then if you see Helm repo list, so here as of now it is showing only that stable repository. So once you um, have the ACR repository, then you can configure that ACR repository also over here. After that, you can just push this charts into your ACR repository. So in future, you can use those charts to deploy the applications like how we are storing inside the because we cannot have this all these charts in the local so we need to store it somewhere else first we'll create it we'll modify it we'll update the files everything will deploy it once we're working fine then that chart will push it to the remote repository so that i know in the acr but uh, i will check apart from uh, cloud uh, registries so how we can create Helm repositories outside uh, of that based on that we can store those uh, charts inside that repositories. Okay. <coughs> so this is how we deployed the applications and uh, now if you see it is running why it is running because for you it will not run it will show in the pending state only because physical volume claim will not work. I have a NFS dynamic provisioner. That's why uh, automatically that pod assigned this one NFS client provisioner. This will provide uh, volumes automatically to this pod. Whichever pod is expecting a physical volume claim, this NFS client provisioner will provision the volumes. So for you, it will not work, but you can just test how to deploy the application. So now I deploy the application from stable repository but in real time what we use helm install what are the chart i created to deploy the applications so that chart i will use it and i'll deploy so chart name and hyphen hyphen name so what are the name you want to give it for deployment this name and hyphen hyphen namespace you can give okay so for the first time you do that but after it is deployed you want to redeploy once again, then here you will give iPhone iPhone install and then we'll give upgrade option over here. So what it will do if it is not installed, deployed for the first time you're doing it will take install. If it's already deployed, then it will take upgrade option. So you might done some changes in the chart. So those changes will apply to the deployment. What are the changes you have done that will apply? Okay. So now Helm list if you see what are the deployments you have done everything it will show now if you want to delete it Helm now I will show you Helm delete This name I'm not giving purge Deployments get deleted and here you see It is getting terminated Nothing is there and uh, we'll see whether it got deleted yes now it was that command okay so again i'm deploying yes uh, how to access externally is a chain case huh? How externally how to access externally or externally access how to access externally in a Jenkins server. You, you want to access that. Jenkins server? Yes. So that's what I said. When we are deploying by default in the Helm chart, it is configured cluster IP. So you need to configure it with the node port. Okay. You need to configure it with the node port. So 
So, I miss that command. If I get the tail inspect command, inspect We can access this values.yaml file and we can modify it because um, I'll show in the chart. So if you see here in the values.yaml file, these are all the values. This is related to the master and some are related to the slave machines. So here you can see okay, service type is mentioned as a cluster IP. So you need to do download this chart, okay, and then change the values to cluster IP to node port, and then you deploy it. Then it will get deployed, and with the help of uh, node port IP means you are wherever work node it got deployed, there it will uh, deploy with these values, and uh, you can able to access it with the node port IP. Cluster IP means what? Internally it can communicate. Excel it cannot communicate. Okay, so that's why you need to use it. So what you can do instead of directly using Helm uh, install, uh, download this Helm chart into your local and uh, do necessary changes in the values.yml file because based upon our requirement, we need to modify it. Okay, what are the values it is given? Maybe it is expecting maybe two CPUs, four GB RAM. If your machine doesn't have that much of capacity, then you need to modify it and then you need to deploy it okay so this change it to cluster ip to node port so that it will work you see here use cluster ip setup includes ingress control if our mini cube setup is to node port elsewhere use load balancer so you need to change this value here so just git clone this repository and use this uh, chart and then again use the same command helm install that time you don't need to give this way stable uh, because this is giving that to connect the stable repository from there download the jenkins chart but if it is in your local then you need to give helm install and the uh, chart name and uh, if and if a name namespace what the name you are giving you can give in that way that way it will work Okay, so I deleted this one and again I'm trying to create it. Okay, Helm install, same Jenkins I'm trying to install. Same name, previously whatever the name was there, I'm giving the same name but I deleted this. Let me see whether I can able to create it or not. You see, a release named Jenkins already exists, but I already deleted this one. You see, already deleted, and even if in Helm list also it will not show. Okay, so this is the problem. So that's why you need to queue hyphen hyphen purge. Now again, if I try to install, it will install. So here both are cluster IP. So this one we need to change it to the this one 
we need to change it to the node port then you can able to access but for in your case it will expect the volumes so you cannot able to create it so what i'll do i'll try one way whether it will work or not if it will get svc and uh, this is a machine cube ctl edit svc we can edit the configuration also uh, but not sure it will apply the changes or not so type uh, will change it to note port on fly it will do it or not i never tried for service note port okay it's changed to note port so cubes it will get parts it is in the running state now kubectl logs the pod name to see the logs okay so someone asked me uh, very long ago if the two pods are running in a container uh, two containers are running in a pod then how to log into specific uh, container so as of now this pod contains two containers so if you check in the describe command kubectl describe pod and uh, this is a pod name two containers are there this is the containers jenkins one container name and uh, apart from that one more container where is that hmm i think this is another one jenkins hyphen sci hyphen config okay so these are the two containers are running so now i want to log into the main container called jenkins okay where jenkins is running so cube ctl execute no i want to check the logs right cube ctl get pods cube ctl logs for name hyphen c jenkins okay you successfully finish download metadata should you fully started then only it can able to access uh, yeah jenkins is fully up and running so now let me take any of the ip of the node taking the public ip 8080 you ctl get ports i for no wide Thirty-two. Same machine itself. Keep it a little bit as we see. Okay, I need to use this port three zero seven zero four. I was using eighty eighty. okay so we need to check the credentials also inside this values.ml what are the credentials they are mentioned that credentials we need to give it here to log into it okay so this is working for you why it will not work because it will expect a volume pvc if you create manually that pvc then it will get created so tomorrow mostly we'll discuss about the volumes okay so different types of volumes how to create all these things 
so after that you can try this concept then you can understand i'll tell you how to configure this one okay because in this scenario this provisor is providing pvc to this uh pod that's why it can able to get so uh, kubectl get pvc so this is the pvc physical volume claim it has been provided to you the jenkins machine so that's why it's working for you it will still show in a pending state because it will expect the pvc those who are having idea about how to create pvc manually then you can create manually then automatically this jenkins uh, machine will pod will take that pvc or else wait for tomorrow's class so tomorrow we'll discuss about uh, volumes and then you can do this practical also okay so this is about uh, the helm and few more comments i'll try to collect and uh, i'll try to gather the information of uh, how to create a remote repository and how we are going to push the helm charts into that remote repository and how to access it all these things we'll discuss okay i'll uh, prepare a document i'll uh, share it <coughs> okay so that you can able to use it because in real time mostly we'll deal with the helm the deployments all the things we'll do it from the helm and then in the coming sessions i will show you by conferring jenkins server the jenkins also same we do these steps so that the jenkins if you configure a job then automatically it should do okay when we just click on the deployment then automatically it should do everything so for that purpose this is all the setup we need to do in the jenkins server as of now i'm using just a linux machine uh, i did not install any jenkins <coughs> excuse me okay if you have any doubts you can ask me or else uh, we'll wind up for today's session <coughs> I mean, you uh, share the document in uh, GitHub? No, this document actually yesterday I modified because um, if it is a Linux machine, not uh, Jenkins server, then I prepared this document. So this is not available in the GitHub. So I'll do one thing. Instead of sharing uh, over there, I will uh, update in the GitHub repository, same in the docs section. Okay, so you guys can later on today you can check. So here inside this <coughs> in the doc section, I'll update this file. Helm Tiller Compression on Linux. I'll give that name. Or else let me do Okay, so in the previous session, we were talking about Kubernetes um, volumes, right? So what we have discussed in that Kubernetes volumes, we discussed the MTDAR host path, right? Basically, we don't use that in the real time because uh, we want a persistent uh, storage, okay? Means the purpose of creating volume is even the pod gets deleted, then still we need our data should be available. So if you use MDDR, then it is not possible to store the data. But uh, if you use host path, then it's possible to store the data. But when you mention three replicas or two replicas, then uh, it is going to take the worker nodes storage. So the data is not going to be synced. So that's the reason even host path is only works if you mentioned um, single replica okay and that too it is taking the worker node storage so if something happens to that worker node then it is not going to get the data okay
so in today's session we will talk about pv and pvc okay pv <coughs> physical volume and in uh, pvc physical volume claim Now in the Kubernetes uh, document also we can able to see that Kubernetes.io we can go to the document documentation here and uh, under the concepts we can see under the concept storage and here we can see persistent volumes. okay so here persistent volume is a piece of storage in the cluster that has been provisioned by an administrator or dynamically provisioned using storage class <clears throat> it is a resource in the cluster just like a node is a cluster resource so pvs are volume plugins like volumes but have a life cycle independent of any individual part that uses the pv so this api object captures and a persistent volume claim is request for storage by a user. It is similar to a pod. Pods consume node resources and PVs consume PV resources. <clears throat> so pods can request specific levels of resources. Claims can request specific size and access. Okay, so here to understand it, we have a cluster. Okay, assume whether it can be EBS, oh, sorry. Um, bare metal like a cubidium or cops okay it can be anything uh, or it can be manager service either aks or uh, aks uh, gke it can be aks or gke or maybe it's maybe bare metal like we manually create virtual machines like how we installed uh, um the cluster software cubidium manually or maybe if you use q uh, cops so as i said cops is not compatible not fully compatible with the gke or aks so maybe assume you installed it with the cubidium concept manually you install it can be anything so you create virtual machines in either uh, aws either aws or azure or gcp these are cloud providers so you are manually creating virtual machines and you are installing kubernetes software with kubedm concept and you are creating a cluster this is one way bare metal another way this manager service these three cloud providers are providing manager service we already discussed so they are going to manage the software and uh, they will help us in case if you get any kind of issue in the kubernetes it's their responsibility to, to help okay so in this scenario we are not going to see master we can just only send the api calls but remaining the worker nodes concept is same okay there or in bare metal or here it's same so bare metal also it can be like we can give cloud names gcp and azure okay these are cloud providers and these are services providing the cloud vendors okay so that it's a managed service they are going to manage it we are not going to uh, install with kubedium so it can be anything okay this assume this worker nodes can be anything this one or this one for physical volume it doesn't matter okay so now we discussed about mtdir and post path so these are not useful as a volume so that's why we have a concept called physical volume and physical volume claim now what it is telling uh, the physical volume it is a resource in the cluster just like a node is a cluster resource so here this worker node 
is a resource this worker node is a resource what it is providing for a part it is providing cpu and ram that's why we are having worker nodes to deploy an application as a part it need resources what resources it need it need cpu ram okay so that's why we have this worker node we call it as a resource same way physical volume is also one of the resource okay this is also one of the resource at the time of namespace topic i told you name uh, some resources will be not part of any namespace that is these nodes are not part of any namespace and the storage is not part of any namespace okay this is also one resource like a worker node okay so this is pv storage okay this is also one of the resource so when we are deploying pod in the pod specification if you are mentioning that it needs some volume then that volume will be provided by the storage if you mention some cpu and ram utilization then we this worker nodes will give that specifications okay resource cpu ram will be provided by this worker nodes so that is a difference so then what is persistent volume claim is a request for a storage by a user it is similar to a pod okay pods consume node resources and pvs consume pv resources so how the pods are using the cpu and ram of a worker node same way the pvcs will consume pv resources means see it's very simple how many of you are aware about the linux operating system like linux logical volume manager are you guys are aware about logical volume manager in the linux no not sure okay hmm. those who know logical volume manager in the linux it will be easy to understand that or else let it be very simple so i'll will create a physical volume of 100 gb okay so 100 gb physical volume when we are creating so this 100 gb physical volume can be used for a pvc claiming okay we are claiming uh, this volume as a pvc so this pvc will be used to a any of the pod okay so when you are creating a pod you will specify in that pod that uh, use this pvc so that that pod will be mounted with this 100 gp okay so when we are creating this pv so this pv we are claiming physical volume is claiming okay so physical volume we are claiming from this 100 gp and this pvc we will give uh, give the definition inside the pod yaml file and then this pod whenever it got deployed then it will use this pvc okay so while persistent volume claims allows a user to consume abstract storage resources it is common that users need persistent volumes with varying properties such as performance for different problems so cluster administrators need to be able to offer a variety of persistent volumes that differ in more ways than just size and access modes without exposing users to the details okay so here the definition like uh, the concept administrator and user why it is they are calling is so let's say i am the kubernetes administrator my responsibility to make sure the pvs are available user in the sense see nowadays in real time sometimes even developers are deploying their applications let's say if we talk about full stack developer so the full stack developer means what he need to know the knowledge he need to have the good experience on the front end like html css javascript and he should know about the back end application okay like java python okay and he should know the database also and apart from that the developer also should know the deployment so nowadays even developers also can able to do our job okay they can also become devops engineer 
because uh, they'll get very good package if they mention that they are a full stack developers so they can deploy what is the deal in deploying the application they can create repositories in the github they can create a jenkins pipelines if you can do coding then do you think it's easier that it's tough to do the configuration of jenkins pipeline and uh, creating github repositories and creating deployment and the kubernetes it's not a big deal for them so sometimes they can also deploy but as a kubernetes administrator or maybe as a devops engineer they are not going to configure kubernetes uh, from scratch they can do that but still uh, as a devops engineer or as a kubernetes engineer administrator it's my responsibility to take care of the manage of azure cloud and uh, managing of maybe the cloud vendors and the managing of this cluster then we call it as an administrator if he is deploying the application then he is called as a user if application is also deploying by me then i will be the user and i will be the administrator but sometimes he is using so he is not going to create this pv it's our responsibility to create this pv then when he is deploying the application maybe it's in the deployment dot yaml like we discussed right different ways to deploy the application so when we deploy the application deployment type then there in the container specification he will mention his application needs a volume so he will give the specifications physical volume claim he will mention and he will check with us whether uh, any pvs are available so that's why his intention is user means whoever deploying the application administrator means cluster administrator means maybe kubernetes administrator obviously it's a devops engineers okay so life cycle of a volume and a claim life cycle means when you create it so there are two ways pvs may be provisioned static and dynamic means this pv when i'm creating this can be created in two ways so one is static means manually i am creating the physical volume so a cluster administrator creates number of pvs they carry the details of the real storage which is available for user used by cluster resource users so manually i am creating the physical volumes by using the yaml file okay we can create dynamic means when none of the static pvs the administrator created match a user's position volume claim the cluster may try to dynamically provision a volume specifically for the pvc this provisioning is based on storage class so the pvc must request a storage class and the administrator must have created and configured the class for dynamic provisioning to occur so here let's say i want to create pv when i am claiming for pvc so that is called dynamic so automatically pv gets created but this is depend upon the storage class so here very important to know about the storage class the storage class is what kind of storage class we are using here okay when we are talking about pv where it is getting created pv so here always you need to remember this pv can be created in different ways okay uh, okay if you see this is persistent volume claim and uh, this is persistent volumes so here this persistent volume when you are creating here this pv whatever you are creating these are the different uh, types of persistent volumes you can create so azure file azure disk csi fiber channel flex volume nfs iscsi cluster fs host path okay so these many types are there so when you are creating this storage pv storage you need to define the storage class means from where would you like to create it assume this this is a kubedm concept created in the aws environment okay it's not an e case it's an aws environment or either it can be e case because e case is also belong to the aws as a manager service then you can use this pv as an ebs right ebs volume you can create here if you see 
AWS Elastic Block Store. So then your storage class will be AWS. Okay, uh, you will have this name Elastic Block Store. The storage class names will be there. Hmm. Okay. So storage class provides a way for administrator to describe the class of a storage they offer. So here if you see the storage class resource. If you see here provisional. So this is the annotation we are using for AWS. And uh, if you see AWS Elastic Block Store, this is a config uh, example and Azure disk and uh, GCE physical uh, sorry persistent disk okay so this is a storage class so we will define provision dot io slash kubernetes the storage class will tell that it will go and talk to the AWS and it will try to create the physical volumes and uh, this is an uh, Azure okay Azure storage class and SKU name standard iPhone LRS. So like we have a provisioned volume gen, uh, general purpose in the AWS same way in the Azure we have a uh, different types of volume types. So you can use which one you want and um, which uh, location the region and storage account. So in Azure we have a concept of to storage account. So that account name from where you want to create this volume. So this storage class will be created. This is also one resource. Okay inside the uh, Cluster and uh, if you see this is an GC so this is a storage class and uh, this is the annotation we give kubernetes dot io slash GC if and persistent disk and uh, type which type of uh, storage like as I said provisioned magnetic in AWS same way different types of storages will be available in each and every cloud so file system type ext4 so this storage class first will create and then this name whatever the name we are giving here this name we will provide inside the pv or pvc so when we are trying to create uh, this pvc then whatever the storage uh, this class name you are av available so that name will be provided so it will intimate to the storage class and then automatically it will create a PV Okay, so if this is an AWS and uh, you have already storage class has been created Okay, and you are creating this PVC in the PVC. You will have a definition of storage class Then what it will do it will intimate to the storage class So if you go to this this assume this is the storage class then what will do? storage class will go and create PV in the AWS means what it will create a volume EBS volume so generally how you will create EBS volume you will go here and uh, you will go to the volume section where it is instance okay he, here volume section you will go and create a volume and that volume will be uh, used in any of the virtual machine but here what will happen when the pvc is created it will create a pv so it will create a uh, it will intimate to the aws and uh, it will create a volume automatically and that volume will be used to this pv that is called dynamically creating but the dynamically creating means you need to have already storage class should be created inside the 
uh, cluster otherwise how come pvc how come it knows that uh, you should create a pv so from where it will create so pv means this many ways you have so in this pvc you need to tell in which way you want to create a what is your source to create a volume that you need to define in the pvc then only it will create a pv automatically so you cannot use uh, uh, this one azure the storage class inside the aws because this is for creating volumes inside the azure not in the aws so this storage class you need to create inside the azure okay not in the aws so same with this one this is in the gcp so gcp is also having concept called gce persistent disk that is similar like aws block store inside the aws same way gcp is also having gc persistent disk if your cluster is in the gce whether it can be gke or whether it can be manually installed kubernetes cluster it can be anything then if you create this storage class just copy this and uh, put it in some file create it and then when you are trying to create pvc then automatically it will create a pv and that pv will be used so the advantage of creating dynamic uh, pvc is here when assume it's a static i am creating 100 gb pv manually assume it can be anything it can be aws block store if it is aws or if it is an uh, azure disk if it is an uh, azure cluster okay anything now only one pv is there and uh, this pv so now i am creating one pvc and pvc request is 20 gb okay i am defining pvc request is 20 gb and this pvc i am going to use it for some pod so now whatever the 100 gb is there this pvc is going to use this 100 gb means we have only one pv so this is going to use this pv for this pvc remaining 80 gb is getting wasted means it is expecting only 20 gb and it doesn't have uh, pvs with 20 gb so that's why what it is going to do whatever the available pv is there it is going to take if it is 100 gb but you are expecting more than 100 gb pvc then it cannot able to use this pv it will show in the pending state it will wait for the required size pv okay until it's available till that time it will show in the pending state so that's why the static is disadvantage is even if it is 100 gb or expecting 50 gb it will take it okay this 100 which is going to take and it will use 50 gb remaining will be wasted okay you cannot use remaining 50 to some other pvc you cannot logically divide these two different pvcs so here that's why you are calling it as a physical volume claim this is not logical volume so physical volume claim is claiming this one and will use it if it is dynamic then whenever pvc is getting created then pv also get created with the same size so that's why sometimes dynamic is recommended okay so this is about the dynamic binding so this pv is binding to a pvc a user creates or in the case of dynamic provisioning user creates means when a user creating an application then he is expecting a pvc for his pod or else the dynamic provisioning has already created a persistent volume claim with a specific amount of storage requested and with certain access modes control loop in the master watches for new pvcs finding a matching pv if possible and binds them together okay if a pv was dynamically provisioned for a new pvc the loop will always bind that pv to the pvc which means if it is not static dynamically pv got created for a 
new PVC, then always that PVC will use the same PV. Otherwise, the user will always get at least what they asked for, but the volume may be in excess of what was requested. So that is what I said. If it is an uh, if it is static, the PV size may be uh, more compared to PVC. So regardless how they were born, a PVC to PV binding is a one-to-one -one mapping using a claim reference which is bidirectional binding between the persistent volume and the persistent volume claim. Claim will remain unbound indefinitely if a matching volume does not exit. So means as I said, PVC physical volume claim will be in the pending state. Okay, so until it gets the right PV the size. Claims will be bound as matching volumes become available. For example, a cluster provision with a many 50 GB PVs would not match a PVC requesting 100 GB. The PVC can be bound when a 100 GB PV is added to the cluster. Okay. So pod uses claims as a volumes means here. This is a PV we are creating. Okay, so this PV we are from this PV we are creating it as a volume, physical volume claim PVC. And from this physical volume claim, we are going to create a volume. Okay. So from this PC, we are creating a volume. And this volume details we will define inside the definition file, YAML manifest file. We call it as a manifest file, whether it's a deployment.yaml file, whether it can be daemon set.yaml file, how you want to deploy your application. As I said, maximum it will be kind will be deployment. Okay, so there you will define in the container specifications to use this PVC as a volume. We'll give as a name. I will show you when I will deploy the application. So this way we will use it. Okay. So mounts that volume for a pod for volumes that support multiple access modes. The user specifies which mode is desired. Okay, we will discuss what is this mode access modes. Once the user has claim and that claim is bound, the bound PV belongs to the user for as long as they need it. Users schedule pods and access their claim PVs by including a persistent volume claim. Mm. Now re reclaiming policy. Okay, means whenever you are creating a uh, PVC or PV, so how you are going to reclaim? So when a user is done with their volume, they can delete the PVC objects from the API that allows reclamation of the resource. The reclaim policy for a persistent volume tells the cluster what to do with the volume after it has been released of its claim. Currently, volumes can be either be retained, recycled, or deleted. Means when the volume is creating, so by its having configuration, so how you want to use it back. So by default, it is in the retain. So the retain means what? Reclaim policy allows for manual reclamation of the resource. When the persistent volume claim is deleted, the persistent volume still exists and the volume is considered released, but it is not yet available for another claim because the previous claimant's data remains on the volume. An administrator can manually reclaim the volume with the following steps. Means, I created this volume, so whenever this volume is, uh, it will be in the retain, means, but the default option is retain. If you don't want that we can change it at the time of creating this PV. So when this PVC is using this PV and mounted the on the pod, 
and this is some data has been generated and later on that part got deleted means we don't want that application we deleted that part but this pvc was using by this as a volume inside the pod so when the pod got deleted this will get deleted but pvc will be remain same so when you delete pvc also okay so till that time this state will be in the which state so positional tells the cluster what to do with the current okay so it will show it as into the release state okay but when you delete pvc it will show into the release state but this pv again you cannot use it for the another pvc it should be in the available state then only it will able to access why because you deleted the pvc but what are the data got generated from this pod the data still remains in this pv that's why it cannot able to attach it to the another pvc so when you create new pvc then it is not going to attach it to this pv okay so for that what you need to do delete the persistent volume the associated storage asset in external infrastructure such as an aws ebs gc persistent disk azure disk okay these are the storage volumes providing by the cloud vendors still exists after the pv is deleted or manually clean up the data on the associated storage asset accordingly manually delete the associated storage asset or if you want to reuse the same storage asset create a new position volume with the storage asset definition okay so these are the things only thing is delete the persistent volume again recreate it so that it will get created once again and whatever the data will be there inside that it will be deleted okay so here assume if this is an created from the aws and from the aws ebs the volume has been created okay so you need to take the backup of this ebs okay you can take the snapshot and then you can delete this so the data will be available in the real time this is how it happens because the volumes can be taken as a snapshot and then you can delete the pv in case if the pvc is been removed then without deleting the pvc you cannot delete the pv because pv is dependent on this one so that's why you cannot delete pv without deleting pvc after deleting pvc you can take the snapshots of this pv and then you can delete it you can recreate so that again you can use it for another pvcs so this is how it happens and another option called delete okay so for volume plugins that support the delete reclaim policy deletion removes both the persistent volume and object from kubernetes as well as associated storage asset in the external infrastructure such as aws what it will do it will when you are deleting the pvc if you configure it this pv with the delete option reclaim policy then this volume pv also get deleted and in the ebs volume what are the volume got created for this pv that is also gets deleted okay so if you go and check in the console aws console ebs ebs volumes it will get deleted from there also from here also it will get deleted if you mention the reclaim policy is delete okay and recycle this i think this is deprecated i think so recycle uh, yeah the recycle reclaim policy deprecated instead the recommendation approach is to use dynamic provisioning okay so if supported by the underlying volume plugin the recycle reclaim policy performs a basic scrub on the volume and makes it available again for a new claim so what it will do it will not delete anything but the same it will be erased everything and it will use it for another volume okay so that is recycle this is a reclaiming policies and uh, it's a very huge topic see this volumes concept is very huge okay i think today also i cannot finish this maybe it will take tomorrow also i am taking enough time to complete this i don't want to just show some yaml files deploy because 
after taking three sessions also still lot of things is there inside this volumes concept so you need to do very good practical okay that's why i'm giving step by step detail idea how we can implement see i if i can show one example but if you guys are working in the real time if you're having gke then you you need to practice creating a storage class in the gke and how to get storage from the uh, persistent disk of uh, gcp persistent disk if it is aks how to use azure disk so again it's a different steps so different clouds we can take one cloud and we can use one example okay but understanding point of view i'm explaining uh, keeping in mind about this all these three so concept will be the same only storage class will be the different and uh, as i said these are the different types of persistent volumes okay mm, anything theoretically still we need to discuss yeah one more thing is there okay when i'm creating a persistent volume access modes okay this is very very important the access modes are a persistent volume can be mounted on a host in any way supported by the resource provider so if you see read write once means the volume can be mounted as read write by a single node read only many means the volume can be mounted read only by many nodes read write many means the volume can be mounted as read write by many nodes okay so which means here i think we don't have enough space let me take another one Mm, here assume we have three worker nodes and uh, we have a deployment okay with three replicas then what it will do it will go and create inside these three worker nodes right and now assume we have a storage you created a storage pv and uh, from this pv it created uh, some pvc and this is assume volume okay now this has been mounted on this three obviously the traffic is coming to this three parts with the help of internal load balancer okay for this service we are creating one load balancer and for another service microservice we create so this is one of the service if you have 15 microservices okay to run your application to run your website whatever it may be this is one of the microservice which is having for high availability three replicas and to three replicas means how the load will be distributed through the load balancer now load balancer is configured now what are the traffic is coming to this load balancer it should divide right so we call it as a read write transactions read means what from front end if any customer is accessing it okay assume it's in um, flipkart okay in flipkart we have a lot of options men skates okay women different category assume for men is one microservice this is a main microservice now i went and i was looking for some shoes okay that is called read transactions right read means what i'm not purchasing anything i'm just doing read means i'm viewing uh, like what kind of shoes are available so this load balancer should send traffic to all these three right then that is the point of having three replicas then if it is only sending to one then what is the point of having three then it should send to all the three for example user one is purchasing something and that request sent to this one that is called write transaction write means what your data is getting changed you are having uh, 10 iphones one person is purchasing one iphone and remaining are only nine right means something is getting modified that is called write transaction another user is also doing the same some other transaction is doing and that request should go here and same way some other user it should be like a round robin fashion right now 
what it called read write many means this volume whatever we are providing it should able to handle read write many read transactions many write transactions many okay so here if you configure how you are configuring read write once means the volume can be mounted as a read write by single node means it cannot be okay only one node one pod wherever it is getting created only one can take the read and write transaction remaining cannot take the read and write transactions okay read write many means the volume can be mounted as a read write by many nodes so this can be mounted on many nodes and it, they can accept the read and write both the transactions so when you are creating you should be careful like how you are creating okay so as shown in the table below providers will have different capabilities and one more thing is if you again it depends upon your storage provider whether they are capable of giving this feature okay so now let's see here if you see elastic block store read write once read only many is not available for it okay azure file is having all read write many read only many read write once okay this is like a shared storage azure disk is also having only read write and self fs file system and um, gc persistent disk is having two options read only many read write once but read write many is not available okay again this is having qbyte nfs is also having full option read write many so this is the storage access modes so what are the volumes you are creating so based upon which storage you are using in which cluster you are based on that you need to decide this one okay so the volume will be in one of the following phases available means what a free resource that is not yet bound to a claim means the physical volume and a bound means the volume is bound to a claim okay when it is bounded to a pvc then the phase will show as an bound when pvc got deleted as i said pvc got deleted okay but this 100 gb volume will be seen as an release state okay, but it cannot be used it can be used only when it is in the available state failed means the volume has failed its automatic reclamation so these are the different phases okay now what i am going to do um, this is my repository go here first i will take the example of host path host path means see what are the host path we discussed previously that is different and here it is different mm, because this is, if you see on the top physical volume okay if you see here the physical volume creation we have an option called host path also okay means i can create with host path also tomorrow i will show you because already i'm using uh, aws right so i will show you by creating volume from this aws and how we can create uh, this one pv okay and uh, with that pv how we can create pvc i will show you how to create pod so now what i'll show you i'll create a host path so again what is host path single node testing only local store is not supported in any way and will not work in a multi-node cluster means what it will do 
this physical volume concept only i am creating it as an host path means here it will create let's say in this machine wherever i am trying to deploy in that machine it will create one pv by using the local storage so that's why host path is not for multi node cluster because when the pod is getting deployed here then it will create a pv by using the local storage of this machine and it will create a pv and that pv will be created as an pvc and that pvc will be used inside the pod okay but that is also not recommended in the real time we need to use either ebs if it is aws and uh, azure disk or maybe gc percentage that i will show you tomorrow okay so how to do that and also we'll discuss dynamic provisioning also we'll discuss so this is what we are going to discuss now is a static provisioning means manually i will create uh, pv and then manually i will create pvc and that pvc i will give it to the um, pod so that pod gets created and we'll use it but basically the recommended is this pv should be external storage so that we'll discuss tomorrow today i will show you by using internal this cluster storage itself that's a concept of host path host path okay means it will create here so that's why it is not uh, possible to have multiple replicas single replica only and if the pod gets deleted if the pod gets created here then that local mount will not be get created here so that is not recommended but just to see how to create pv and how to create pvc okay we'll discuss okay quickly i will show you and tomorrow we'll discuss in detail way so here inside this kubernetes if you see pv hyphen host path okay so let me copy this hmm. Okay. Or else I'll create a directory called storage. I'll put all these files inside this directory. So now first I would like to create a physical volume vi pv dot yaml or maybe pv hyphen post path dot yaml. So here I'm copying it sorry okay so for host path we are not using any uh, what we say aws storage or maybe azure storage or maybe any external ffs we have different storage types we are not using it for host path that's why i'm using as a manual here okay storage class name is manual in case if you are using aws block store then before creating persistent volume you should create a storage class first the uh, manifest file which i've shown you so first you need to create this one so again it depends upon you iops per gb how much you are giving okay for, that is uh, depend upon you it's thousand ten thousand how much you want to give file system okay so this you need to provide this should be created for storage class should be created and what are the name you are giving here this name should be provided here storage class name then it will contact the storage class name and storage class will go and talk to the aws and it will get created the volume okay but as of now i am using local host path so that's why it is as a manual okay and um, capacity 
1 GB PV I am getting created if you see this kind is PV and version 1 means it's very old object we discussed about this API versions apps v1 means its latest object v1 means pretty old object in the kubernetes and access mode you can see read write once always you can use only read write once this is a local host path and host path path is getting created slash cube okay because it is using the storage of this particular worker node okay wherever it get deployed so in this local storage it is getting created slash cube and that slash cube is creating as a physical volume from this worker node so if this is a worker node so here it is getting created slash cube so it's acting like a physical volume and this physical volume you can use it for the physical volume claim so now let me use this cube ctl create iphone f already exists okay cube ctl get pv okay this is already available hmm. cube ctl I'm not sure. Okay, it's already if you see here. This is in the release state, but this is in bound state. So first time to delete the PVCs because here if you see it's bounded to this PVC. This will be deleted, but this will not be deleted because status if you see this is bound to some volume. Let me open. It is taking time. Okay, anyhow, uh, we can execute this command now. CD storage, kubectl create iPhone F. Got created, kubectl get PV. If you see, this is in available state. Just now I created this one. And the name I given inside the YAML file is PV iPhone host path. The capacity is 1 GB and access mode read write once reclaim policy retain by default i did not mention here inside this i did not mention but by default uh, it will take this policies like for example if you want to see cube ctl get pv i know yaml i want to convert into the yaml file so whatever the default options will be there that will be visible um where it is see persistent volume claim policy retain when you want to change it then you need to give this value same exactly like this and then you can change it here delete or recycle what option you want to give then you need can give here by default it is taking it as an retain okay so these are the subcategories of this spec field of the volume whatever let's say spec under for volume there is 100 specifications but manually we are giving only few remaining all will take by default okay that we need to go in the api of this uh, persistent volume there we can able to see so now this is written Status available means any PV can take this. If you see here, claim not claimed by any PVC and storage class is manual. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a PV. Okay, so in the same, uh, sorry, PVC I will create. 
the same repository we have a pvc hyphen host path this is two files we go to the pvc and here i'm selecting okay clear this now uh, vi pvc hyphen health no, sorry host path dot yaml now if you see this is persistent volume claim kind is and what is the name we want to give it's up to you what are the name this is pvc and for pv i give pv hyphen host path for pvc i'm giving pvc hyphen host path and again if you see storage class name here we are giving manual what are the storage class we are using it's a default manual and this pvc is also here i'm not telling to use specific pv okay i'm just claiming if pvs are available then it gets created if pvs are not available it will give in the pen pending position it will wait till pv should be available okay so resources request is i'm doing 100 mb only okay now when i create this let me do before this uh yeah well, let me save this and before that cubes it will get pvc let me check there is a same with same name one uh, is available so kubectl delete pvc kubectl get pv okay this is the one which i created it's showing now and uh, for pv and for pvc nothing is showing now i can create these are two old pvs okay we can ignore that cube ctl create hyphen f pvc hyphen host path now cube ctl get pv if you see here bound previously it was showing available this one host path 1 gb now it is showing bound to this pv okay showing status also bound so i created 100 uh cubes it will get pvc if you see i raised request for only 100 gb 100 mb but it is using 1 gb volume because apart from that there is no other volume found for that pvc that's why it took one gb volume okay so quickly what i'll do uh, i'll create a this is a busybox.yaml you can use this <coughs> i'll use this one vi busybox.yaml okay so now if you can see here in the container specification first of all in the volume specification you can see this is as i said pvc it will be used by the volume so in the volume section i'm giving some name some volume name and what i'm giving to use this to have this volume i should use persistent volume claim so this is a pvc name what are the pvc got created this is the name of that pvc so this is acting like a volume inside the pod and in the container specification this volume is getting mounted here if you see volume mounts the name the name of this volume is getting mounted inside this container and mount path what are the application file system path is there that path you are going to give so this volume will be mounted inside this one and how this volume is getting created by using this persistent volume claim it's getting created and where it got created from the pvc so now if i save this and uh, cube ctl create iphone f busybox.yaml file cube ctl get parts busybox is running right so now if you go cube ctl execute if an it logged into that container and if you see here my data has been available
so in the previous session we were discussing about uh, volumes physical volume and physical volume claim and um, we created physical volume manually and we created physical volume claim and also we created a pod which is using the pvc so that we can able to access the storage so let us go through once again and then we we'll discuss about uh, how dynamically we can create physical volumes so we were creating physical volumes through static way right so we have another option dynamic way how we can create it So this is what we discussed yesterday so physical volumes gets created this is also same like this worker node worker node is going to provide you cpu and uh, ram for the pod and uh, storage physical volume will provide storage to the pod so with the help of this pv we can create pvc and that pvc can be added inside the uh, pod definition file whether it can be deployment definition or maybe stateful set it depends okay so we have seen statically how we can create this pv and uh, how we can create pvc from this pv also we discussed uh, um, if you use 100 gb pv and uh, if you are trying to create 50 gb pvc it is going to take this 100 gb pv okay so it means if it will check if you have multiple pvs available and uh, when you're trying to create pvc then whichever is suitable for that pvc it will take the respect to pv if you have 100 gb 80 gb 60 gb pvs and you are trying to create 50 gb pv it will take 60 gb PV. okay so statically we were creating and uh, let's say we were in the middle of that so let me log into that server kubectl get pv this was the pv which we created and uh, kubectl get uh, pods you see this is the pod which is running and uh, kubectl get pvc okay so this is a pvc and this is a pv so this pv was using this pvc what we have done first we created pv and then we have created uh, pvc and then that pvc we were using inside the uh, pod okay so now you see here this is an uh, pod where it is a pod and this is a pod which is using the busy box and inside that it is using this if you want to see kubectl describe pod and you can use busy box for name and here if you see volume section so this is a describe command to see detailed information about this and uh, if you see here volume section it's a persistent volume claim it is using and this is a pvc it is using okay so with the help of this pv it is mounted inside this okay and if you see my data it has been mounted so it can be used so but we were using this as an host path right so already yesterday we have seen 
kubectl get pv okay so if, like you can see pv and pvc is by giving the comma no need to execute two separate commands and this is a pv and these are the pvcs okay so here we discussed pv so this pv is uh, bounded with bound and this is bounded with this specific pvc so in the pvc configuration you are not specifying to go and contact or bind with which pv automatically it will take okay and we already discussed reclaim policy like retain recycle delete option so by default it will be in the retain and access modes also you can give what kind of access modes you are giving and the size so we discussed uh, the files the physical volume creation and uh, pvc creation and busy box creation right think, uh, not uh, what was the directory we created yesterday i think storage yes so these are the three files one is for creating pv and then pvc and then busy box now we'll talk about dynamically how we can provision the physical volumes we i am not going to create physical volume first why because i don't know like for example, if I create 100 GB, then maybe the requirement is 50 GB, then it will take the 100 GB physical volume for PVC. So instead of that, whenever PVC gets created, at that time, PV also should get created. So that whatever the size we are expecting for PVC, that with that size only, the PV gets created. So for this, we have one of the option, okay? So one of the option called us, nfs dynamic provisioner so how many of you know about uh, nfs nfs volume what is nfs file sharing A network file share Yep. So, is everyone aware about that? If no, then please let me know. Then I will explain you a little bit in detail what is exactly NFS. If you guys know, then I'll skip introduction of that NFS. It's better to explain. Okay. So NFS here to talk about NFS. It's not those who don't know. Maybe here in this batch, a lot of people has been joined. Maybe those who listen the recording, okay. So they might also not aware about, some people might not aware about NFS. So NFS is not belongs to either cloud or not, it's not belongs to only Kubernetes topic. NFS is available since many years, okay. Before cloud has been introduced, it was using in the Linux environment, okay. When the data centers was there, uh, the companies used to have uh, hundreds of servers whether it's a virtual machines or physical machines from that time onwards this nfs concept is available it's not belongs to any cloud or this topic is not belongs to specifically kubernetes that old topic nfs we are using inside the cloud and kubernetes now as of now so what is this nfs network file service okay so what does it mean network file service means let me explain in a simple way let's say in our office when i was going in a night shift okay uh, we used to get a lot of time this is i think maybe seven years ago so we used to have a lot of time so we used to watch movies okay because we were in support so whenever the ticket comes we need to work so during that free time we used to watch movies so whoever working in the night shift, what we used to do, we used to collect all the movies, whether it's in a regional film or maybe national film or English. Okay. So all the collections, if I get any film downloaded from internet like that. So where we need to keep, let's say overall it became 200 GB. Now, if 10 people, we are friends in that night shift and we want to watch movies, then what should be there? We need to have the 200 GB in each and every member's laptop or desktop wherever we are working. 
so in each and every person's laptop it's 200 gb is there then from all the 10 people's laptop it occupy 200 gb for every one laptop we are wasting the storage right so instead of that what we can do we can take one machine okay okay let's say my machine my laptop there i'll create a directory and i'll put all this 200 gb content over there and then i'm going to share it even in our windows machine also we can share the content right so if you right click the directory sharing option will be there so if you share that then no need to download that content for all of them if they know my ip just they'll go here uh, run okay so here they'll give this my ip address and what is the directory i shared that directory if i give then i can able to access that so remaining guys whenever they want to watch movies they can able to uh, access through the network and they can able to see so they no need to install uh, then you need to download all those content in their local desktop or laptop in the office so this way they are saving 200 gb space right and um, whoever now collecting the information they will same way they will access in this way and they will copy that content okay so i mean this means in the one central location we are copying the data the copying the movies and whoever want in the floor we are able to access it and we can watch the movies so this way we are saving a lot of storage so same way nfs is also same thing i want some data should be available here 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 some machines okay so instead of creating a file system your file system means whether in windows d drive e drive what are the file system you use ntfs or fat 32 in linux also we have ext4 xfs ext3 line file systems will be there so you need to create a file system means with 100 gb 200 gb file system you need to create and the data should be copied inside this one so why we are wasting unnecessary storage because in real time storage is very costly because it's an ssd drives we are using and uh, storage team allocating 100 GB, 100 GB, 100 GB means it will almost 300, 500, maybe 1 TB of storage we are wasting. So instead of that, so we'll create one machine here. This is called as an NFS. And this NFS server, we are going to share the directory. Let's say data directory is there. Here all that content is there. And this I'm going to share it to these three machines. So how I'm going to share, I'm going to give this machine's IPs in the NFS configuration file. So NFS configuration file is, this is the configuration file. So here I'm going to give the IP address, okay? And I can decide whether it's a read write or a read only option and some more configuration is there. We are not going deeper inside the NFS topic now, just to understand what exactly NFS is. So we can give, ip and uh, we can give access okay to these machines once it is done then how these machines know that we have an nfs share you need to mount it okay you need to mount this nfs share inside these machines so further we use mount command mount hyphen t which file system it is nfs is one of the file system like uh, uh, fat 32 ntfs in windows and linux this is also one of the file system nfs netro file system netro file service we can call and uh, the ip ip address of your nfs server let's say this is nfs server and the whatever it is sharing and uh, in local in this machine where you want to mount it maybe data one so what it will happen it will create a file system in this machine this is a network file system okay through network you are getting this file system generally file system means what locally you will create right locally you will create whenever the server down whenever the server up you can able to access that but this is coming through this network this file system is mounting here okay so if the server goes down you cannot able to access this mount point over here so this way this can be mounted in this machine so that this data can be accessed on these machines maybe that application is expecting some data some information which is mounted through this network file system so that it can be accessed okay 
so this is how we use network file system through network you are mounting a file system to machines this is the concept of nfs now this concept we are using in the kubernetes for dynamic nfs provisioner okay so not only for dynamic okay just now yesterday also we have discussed right this pv when we are creating i have used which to, which concept host path right so if you see here cat pv hyphen host path so here i was using host path okay so this is host path instead of this we can use nfs also manually even static also you can use nfs the advantage is local host path means what it is doing here it is creating a, a directory called whatever the name we are giving with that it's creating a volume pv it's creating so it's not good because if this worker node goes down then data is not going to sync here but if you have your storage externally from your cluster then it can be accessed anywhere even the pod is getting created here here no need to worry because storage is available external of your cluster so what you can do you can create nfs here and this nfs from here you can create a pv and this pv you can create pvc and you can give it to the pod so from external you are getting the storage so even pod got deleted here if it is getting created here no need to worry because the data is still available in the external world external means not in your kubernetes cluster i was using host path so even in static environment also you can use this server nfs server okay so now this nfs concept we are using in the dynamic provisioner how we can use it okay so now how we are using this in the cluster so if this is our uh, cluster environment maybe and uh, these are our assume worker nodes okay now this is master and uh, worker node one worker node two worker node three now what we are going to do here out of this cluster i am going to create one more virtual machine in aws environment whether wherever you are practicing if it is an azure or if it is a gcp then this is another virtual machine or if you have both in your environment you have on premises data center and cloud and both are able to communicate with vpn okay then it can be in a separate your on premises machine also there should be network connectivity whether it's in the cloud or out of the cloud it doesn't matter there should be a communication between this cluster and this machine okay so now this is an nfs server so here what i'm going to do nfs server i'm going to configure same way uh, by default in the Red Hat linux or maybe all the linux flavors most of the linux flavors we are going to get nfs package by default we no need to install this nfs package previously we used to install nfs package now we no need to install it by default it will be available but only we need to check whether that service is on or not if it is not on then we need to make sure it is started okay once it is done then create some directory okay so create any some directory something like this any directory it's up to you you can create any directory so now um where is this uh, created that is also matters assume if it is an aws environment so whatever this directory are getting in real time don't create this in the slash file system why because slash is having 8 gb it's belong to operating system if something happens to operating system then whatever the volumes you are creating from here that will be also corrupted so instead of that allocate new volumes okay if it is an aws 
then allocate let's say 100 GB volume separately apart from OS and with that volume you can create separate file system separate drive in Windows we call D drive E drive same way in Linux also we call file system separate file system and that file system this is the one assume this is a file system and then you share this one okay in etc export it's very simple three commands in etc exports we will add this path and we'll give to whom we are giving access okay so now after doing that just we can check show mount hyphen e okay then it will show whether it's mounted or not and after that what i'm going to do when here in the cluster i am going to deploy some um, helm chart not only helm chart we can use individual files also so what it will do it will call as an nfs provisional so this deployment i need to do okay so while doing this deployment inside this configuration file i will give this is my nfs server so that what it will do it will create one pod assume it created here so this is called nfs this pod is called nfs client provisioner means this pod will act like a gateway to your other application pods so whenever you are deploying any pods application pods which is expecting a pvc or pv then this will help you to create a physical volume claim and physical volume automatically in prometheus i will show you because prometheus needs a physical volume and pvc i am not going to create either pvc or pv so prometheus whenever i'm deploying it automatically it will get created pvc because this nfs client provisioner will help to create pvc and pv how it will work that i'll show you in the uh, prometheus class okay as of now i'll in today's practical only the pv gets created automatically when i create pvc but in real time when i'm creating application my pvc also should create it and pv also should be created i am not going to create only i will give the name of this storage class yesterday i discussed storage class so which storage class you are using if this is nfs nfs storage class i will show you those so here we need to do we need to create three um, components okay one is deployment dot yaml one is uh, r back and one is storage class one is for deploying your nfs client provisioner and second one is are back role based access control so let me show you basically to get this nfs client provisioner we have helm chart also means we have discussed in the helm uh, the stable repository which are providing some uh, predefined helm charts for this nfs client provisioner also they are providing from that i copied only specifically some files okay so now uh helm charts for nfs client provisioner so if you see this is the first one nfs client provisioner now if you go inside the templates okay if you see here deployment this is a deployment.yaml file okay so which is configured with all the zip conditions and uh, it will be available in the what we say values.yaml file so this is a storage class and uh, these all are getting created if you see here 
So now what I'm going to do, I copied only few files from that and I modified accordingly so that easily we can understood GitHub. And inside the docs. So NFS and deployment. So if you check this NFS and deployment, this is a kindest deployment. This is just a name. I'm providing this for this deployment. And uh, if you see here, this is the image it is taking. So this contains NFS configuration. This image contains NFS configuration. And uh, here, what it is doing? Here we need to give NFS server details. Means wherever you are creating this NFS server, this machine IP. This mission IP you are giving inside this configuration and uh, path. What is the path you are configured here? Okay, so whatever the path you are trying to share, that path you need to give it here. Okay, and this is creating like a volume. So, same here also you need to give NFS server IP and the path. So, this is taking as a volume from the NFS server and it is mounting inside the pod this one okay so this will help you to create pvcs for your applications so this nfs client provisioner pod get so first what it will do first it will get mounted here this one will be get mounted inside this pod this shared directory will be mounted here and from here this nfs client provisioner will help you to use this mount point to mount it in the pods okay if this is expecting pvc that will be get created from here okay and uh, logically you can go and see here means physically it will be available here the data will be storing here and if you create one pv pvc in this directory it will create one directory that contains belongs to one physical volume if you create another pod and with another pvc and that will also get created here content here and here it is coming from this machine so here it gets created we'll see practically how we can do that okay so this is mounting here in the nfs client provisioner and this is helping by using this storage it is helping to create file system suppose I'm using this 100 GB and this 100 GB is mounted here and it is let's say this is 10 GB and this is 10 GB has been created and attached to the pod. One request was the 120 GB. Can NFS client provisioner can able to create it? Yes, it can able to create it. Okay, it will create it. But if really 100 GB data is fill, filling, then it cannot able to fill the data because backend the volume is only 100 GB this will get in full right so initially it will be empty so that's why it will get created when the data is filling up then it cannot able to fill that data but it will not give you an error that we don't have sufficient space okay so this way it is going to work so now here we are giving nfs so the what are the pod is getting created nfs client provisioner pod inside that pod the nfs server volume is going to mount okay so whatever the capacity you are giving back end you can take the backup of this volume so that the data will be available this is how it will work and uh, after this deployment one more two more files we need to execute one is um, this one rback.yaml what is this rback you can name it anything for easily understanding purpose i provided uh, rbac role based access control this is like pseudo permissions in the linux operating system let's say for application users we don't give full access to the os we give uh, specific access means some commands we are going to give access to start their application so if you, if you want to give some level of access then we'll add into the sudo file what are the commands they can execute as a normal user which they cannot able to execute by default but will provide access to execute some uh, commands not full and we can give full access also if you want we can give in the sudo file if you mention all all then it will be 
access by that user everything he can able to access same way in the cluster also we are not we are going to give access to users or specific service to use only some portion of the kubernetes cluster that is with the help of this role based access control we have separate session for this completely okay so for that we are going to create a role and for that role we are going to apply rules here if you see here so we are just giving access only to the volumes related stuff not everything on the cluster so cluster role if you see it is getting created and cluster binding so these are related to the role binding cluster role cluster role binding role and role binding these are the four topics we are going to discuss separately okay so this is role based access so for us here for our nfs provisioner we are not giving complete access because whenever the pod is getting created this nfs client provisioner should have authority to to create pv and pvc right automatically it is creating so it should have access to the cluster and its responsibility to only have the pv and pvc the storage related stuff apart from that it does not require any other access to the kubernetes cluster so that's why this roles defined only to access the storage related stuff storage class storage uh, um, annotations okay volumes get list watch update only about this and vol volumes uh, resources persistent volumes and get uh, watch create delete only related to the volumes okay we are giving permissions and the third file is the storage class which is very very important class.yaml so go here if you see this is a name okay so managed iphone nfs storage this is the name we are giving because this is if it is not if it is aws yesterday i shown you the storage class will be different annotation we are going to use and if it is uh, a case different annotation here main annotation is important so here this is a default class true means what so this is a default one so managed nfs service name you can give any name here so this is the storage class okay so provisional if you see this is a nfs it's a provisional we are telling that so that it can accept so storage class is also very very important while creating volumes because it should know your cluster should know who is the provision for creating physical volumes and physical volume claims see physical once you create physical volume from that physical volume you can get physical volume claims but from where this physical volumes should get created that will be decided at the provisioner okay the storage class if this is not correct then you are not going to create volumes properly physical volumes it will show in pending state so we need to create this three so i need to copy locally this three okay so what i am going to do already this has been implemented previously uh, so let me delete all of them if you see kubectl get parts if you see here nfs client provisioner this is already provision so nfs from inside this this is the files so what i am going to do kubectl delete hyphen f nfs hyphen f r back hyphen f class like we can give multiple files in a single command so whatever the resources was got created from these files everything gets deleted okay now if you see kubectl get parts that nfs client provisioner is getting deleted so i am not going to copy these files from my github so already these files are available so but i need to configure nfs server first so this server first i need to configure where it is this is the one okay so for that i need to have one linux machine mm, i have many linux machines in my aws account so let me use any of that machine 
I need to delete unnecessary missions. Unnecessary, I'm getting bill. I'm not sure how much bill I got for this month. Now I need to take one mission. Let me see which mission I need to power on. Any mission, all are the Linux missions only. So this Tomcat server previously I was using as a NFS server. Mm. Let me take this one. I don't know what is this server. Okay, this mission is powered on. Now let me log into this mission. What happened? What is the key for this one? Two batch. Okay, this is Ubuntu mission. I don't want Ubuntu. Let me use this Docker. Okay, so this is a machine. So let me log into this machine. I think the key is separate for this. One. So it's working on the Linux machine. Yes, NFS will work only for Linux machine. Right. Okay. For Windows, you have a Samba shares. Same concept, Samba shares for Windows. From Windows to Linux, if you want to mount, you have a CIFS file system. If you have a Windows server, from Windows server, you want to share something to a Linux server, then you need to configure CIFS. Okay, pair. And Windows to Windows, we can use Samba. Okay, so by default, NFS package will be available. You can check with the RPM command. Okay, NFS package will be available. Only thing is, you need to check whether NFS is running or not. It is not running. So you need to start it and make sure it's power on. It's the service will be on during the server reboots also. For that purpose, you need to execute this command, chk. 
config nfs on so this will be come online when the server boots also otherwise service will go down whenever server reboots so again manually you need to start it if the service is down then nfs share disconnect okay so once it is done very simple so go to the vi etc exports file okay here inside it will be empty file you can give multiple shares to multiple different hosts so configure nfs client provisional kubernetes Okay, so this way you can create a directory if you want whatever the directory you want you can create and just give the permissions you can give full permissions also and then the share that directory in the nfs path okay this is the path and this is the directory what are the directory we created and your star means what it's an uh, basically ips okay in this scenario like we were talking about uh, the traditional data center there we used to give the ips where you want to mount but here we don't know the ip of this worker nodes right worker nodes can be created and new worker node might be created so we don't know where is this nfs client provisor is going to mount it okay so if it is mounting here then it will will use this worker node ip if it is mounting here it will use this worker node ip so a new worker nodes also might be created so manually i cannot enter this worker node ips inside the exports file that's why we can give star so anywhere it can go and mount it okay means all ips and then just restart the nfs service these are not required and uh, that's it okay nfs is ready then i need to execute these three files in the cluster but before that i need to use the nfs server ip address inside this deployment.yml file and what is the path we i need to use inside this volume of this deployment.yml file so here before that so here i am not creating any new volume and uh, for from uh, aws to create a new file system here when i type dffnh i have only one file system here that is slash oh my god it's already 100 percent usage this i cannot use it It is not deleting RM. Hmm. 
instead of creating this, let me take another machine or I need to create new machine. Let me take Nexus. So let me log into this machine and see whether we can able to create it. And let me see the key to batch. Okay. I log into the another machine. So service NFS status start chk config NFS on. That's it. Now make directory NFS share. This is a directory I'm giving uh, or else uh, NFS client provisional this is a directory ch mode if an r shape sorry giving full permission okay and now this information i need to this directory see this directory created as a normal directory where it got created under the slash so slash is having only 8 GB as I said create a new volume attach it to your uh, machine this machine and uh, create a new file system okay new file system means new uh, drive okay like D drive E drive create new drive and use that directory for your volumes okay so here now vi etc exports it will be empty by default and uh, this way these are the nfs options okay and uh, nfs nfs client provisioner this is a directory star means for everyone okay so cat etc exports just i want to confirm whether i created mention the okay i did not provide correct directory so let me modify once again okay so it has been provided now export fs iphone ra sorry vr correct only right show mount iphone e 
show mount if any it is showing okay it's mounted and it's uh, able to access through network okay so it is having star so means in this network anywhere if you go and check show mount if and e and the nfs or ip then there it will show this nfs shape okay so for testing purpose what i'll do manually first of all directly to go and execute these three files okay so first of all i want to mount manually any of the work or not assume this is one of the linux machine just i want to test it whether this is going to mount it here or not okay then again i will unmount it so that when i deploy this deployment automatically the pod gets created then it will use this nfs uh, mount and it will mount it so first of all manually i want to test it so for that i'll take uh, one of the ip of any of the worker node so let me take this one and uh, log into it mm, send os If any problems are there we can solve it here then dynamically means when i'm deploying the nfs client provisioner so easily it can go and mount it show mount hyphen e and the ip address of the nfs server 172 172.31.48 172.31.48 251 okay it is not showing and it is waiting and i'll try to mount it Let me open another session. Can one tell me why it is not trying to access NFS server? Now this is a command mount type and T NFS 172.31.4848.251 and uh, this is a mount point so where locally where you want to mount let's say data assume data okay it is not going to mount can anyone tell me why hmm? very simple two reasons one is in this machine you need to check nfs is running or not and nfs service status okay and second thing is it's already available second thing is uh, port the main important is port here nfs server wherever you created it's run on some ports okay so that nfs server use some ports if you want to see okay here netstat iphone ntlp so this rpc dot mount uh, it is using right these are nfs ports okay so these ports should be accessible by the nodes wherever it is trying to access so that's why what we need to do in the firewall of this uh, in the security group of this machine i am going to give full access okay if you see one 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 three two eight two one rpc bind mount so what i'm going to do here this is a 
NFS server, right? Go to the security groups. Incoming rules, edit, add rule, all traffic. I'm giving all traffic for everyone and then save. Now go to the same worker node of one of the machine from cluster and try to access it. Now it is done, right? Now if you see here, it is from NFS server. This is the source. It is mounted. Okay, so it's working. So we resolved one issue was there firewall port issue. We resolved it. It's mounting. Just you do unmount slash data. Then again, it will be unmounted. Nothing is there now. Okay, just for testing purpose, I've done this. Now I'll go to the master. Where is the master? So this is my master three eighty seven. Where is my master? This is my master. So here, these are the three files are available. Now, first, only I need to modify NFS hyphen deployment file. Why? Because here I need to define my NFS server IP address. So here NFS server IP address is 172.31. Hmm, where is the IP address? 251 I think so is it correct what is up I'm giving private IP because these all are internal seen the same subnet that's why I'm giving 48.51 NFS server IP inside this and uh, what is the NFS path here I created I need to give that path name mm, what is that This is the one in the compression file. I'm giving this information and same thing in the volume section. Also, we need to give NFS or IP. So 48.251 and then path. Okay, and this volume which are getting from the NFS server inside this NFS client provisioner container, how you want to mount, you need to define it here. This you can give anything, okay? So inside when the containers get created, the pod is gets created inside this, this path will be mounted on this one, okay? So now let me save it and create it. kubectl create iphone f nfs iphone deployment iphone f r back and class unexpected arguments class dot yaml seek will create iphone as well okay i did not give iphone f here okay means we need to give this is a file so I missed to give your file. So now whatever is in our back, it got created cluster role, cluster role binding, service account, everything. And in NFS deployment, this was the object deployment. And in class, this was the object storage class. And these all are related to our back service account, cluster role, cluster role binding. Okay. All are got created. UCTL get pods. You see here NFS client provisioner is running. Okay, so now kubectl uh, describe a pod. Now 
now it started and if you see volumes nfs it got it from the nfs this is nfs server and this is a share okay successfully it's mounted from the nfs server now what i'm going to do uh, i log into that pod cube ctl exit hyphen it this is the pod dffnh and if you see this is from the nfs server and it got mounted inside the container so this is going to work as a gateway for the physical volume claims and pvs okay so this is how we were trying to achieve so now this has been created so whenever i'm going to create a pod now so that pod is going to be uh, or whenever i'm going to create a pvc physical volume claim then automatically pv gets created previously i was creating pv and then i was using that pv for one pvc but now there will be no pvs so what i'm going to do i'll go to the let me come out of this cube ctl get pv uh, cube ctl delete pv let me delete this First of all, we need to delete the uh, pod. Then we can delete the this one. If the if we don't delete the pod, then this will not get deleted. So let me log into another session. So right now I'm in the master and I'm checking what are the existing uh, PVs are available. Cube CTL get PV see they are getting terminated let it be so now what i'm going to do there will be no pvs i'm not going to create any pv i will create a pvc so for creating pvc also i have a document in my docs repository okay if you see this nfs provisioner open it this is a persistent volume claim okay so there is no pvs as of now they are got terminated right now same cd nfs hyphen provisioner i create a file called uh, vi nfs pvc dot yaml so now if you go through this one this is just a persistent volume claim i'm trying to create there is no pv is there automatically it should create and this is storage class you need to modify this one okay if you give just manually it will not work why because kubectl get storage class this is the storage class we just created four minutes ago okay nfs provisioner so this name i need to give it here we are telling persistent volume claim that use this storage class so then only this will go and talk to the nfs otherwise it will not create okay so now what i'll do nfs hyphen pvc this is the name of the storage class which we created and then rewrite many or rewrite once you can give and uh, how much storage capacity you are expecting 500 MB or 200 MB. Got created. And before that, where is our NFS server? Okay, this is our NFS server. So if you go to NFS. Nothing is available in this directory, right? NFS share. Now again, I'll go here and uh, cube CTL create hyphen F NFS hyphen PVC. I'm creating a physical volume claim now. 
cubectl get pv pvc okay this is see here it is showing in the pending state manage nfs storage and this is the one there is no volume is available as of now what happened so let me cube ctl describe pvc CTL describe uh, provision failed uh, NFS client provisioner. I failed to provision volume with uh, storage class manager in so it could not able to create um, read only file system oh. what was the um, cat etc export it's a rewrite file system read it in no root scratch So let me log in to that. Hmm. Wherever it got created. QCTL get uh, pods. Where is that? Here it is. QCTL get pods. The gateway I'm logging in. CD Okay, that is a problem. What are the file system we mounted? It is um, mounted as a read only file system. That's why this is not allowing to create a persistent volume. Those are the Linux guys. They can easily understand the file system can be read only and read write. So here um, This one so this has been mounted here, right? Uh, under this file system As in Persistent volumes so here directories gets created when you create a PVC the PV get created from here But here it is not allowing to create any files. That's why PV is failing to create Means there is something problem from NFS server to here. There may be issues, okay mm.
see here full permissions. So do we need to give nobody, nobody change owner? Maybe that is just this. I, let me see in my previous mission how it I provided in this mission. Chat ETC exports. Oh, there is a no space between star and this one. Okay. So that is a mistake maybe I'm doing. That's why it's not able to mount it properly. So where is my NFS server? See here, I gave star space. Okay. So let me do one thing. Let me remove this. These are the options I'm giving. Okay. Now service NFS restart. Now it's restarted perfect. Okay. Previously it was giving errors because the wrong entry. And show mount from E. It is showing. And uh, So better, again, we can uh, redeploy deployment.yaml file, okay. Means, or else, uh, service NFS. To apply the changes, this part I'm going to create once again. Okay, 
so what i'm going to do i deleted the pod and uh, i'm going to use this nfs deployment once again kubectl create hyphen f nfs hyphen deployment oh this is it kubectl delete deployment Now again, I'm going to create it. Okay. So now kubectl get pods. Now let me log into this pod. kubectl execute iphone it. It is mounted. Now let me see whether I can able to create files or not inside this one. Yes, I can able to create files. Okay, see this is also by default showing one directory. Hi guys, good morning everyone. So today we are discussing about uh, dynamic provisioner and uh, for dynamic provisioning we selected NFS. So we created an external NFS server from there we uh, created one uh, NFS share and that share by using that share we deployed NFS client provisioner pod inside the cluster so that it can uh, become the gateway so that this nfs client provisioner can become the gateway for the pods which required pvc or pv and we created yesterday pvc and automatically pv got created so now one thing is left inside this we need to create a uh, pod and i'm going to use that pod okay i'm going to use that volume inside that pod the pvc whatever i created so that we can able to access this pvcs to the pods okay so let me log into it Logged into the master server. So yesterday we executed these um, YAML files. So one is for NFS deployment, so that it deployed NFS client provisioner, and um, also class storage class we created, role based authentication, access control we created, and finally when we executed this one NFS. So kubectl get pvc so this is a one okay pvc got created so how it got created automatically it got created and uh, the physical volume automatically got it created get pv so this is the one okay and it's using this one so now this pvc we can give it to any of the pod so we need to give this name so what i'm going to do um, okay so i'll copy this busy box uh, yaml file to the NFS provisional directory. Again, I'll go back to that. 
so here i copied this file busybox so that i will create a part with this yaml file so busybox is one of the type of image okay so like nginx why we are using nginx so busybox is an image so we can create a part with that so open this and here the volume name it's up to you what are the volume name you want to give you can give inside that and this is a persistent volume claim so here i need to use the persistent volume claim change the name so what was the name it got created in the pvc pvc hyphen nfs hyphen pv1 so this is the name pvc nfs hyphen what was it after nfs pv1 okay this is the name persistent volume and inside that uh, container this volume will be mounted as a mount path slash data and uh, this is the volume name okay so means persistent volume we are using it as a volume for this container and directly persistent volume cannot be mounted so we need to tell that okay this is a volume and this is a volume name you can give any name and this volume we are getting it from the pvc and this volume we are mounting inside the container okay so we are telling the kind of that this is a volume and uh, mount it on the slash my data so that it can be mounted now kubectl let me check get parts all the busy box is there which we created delete but our nfs client provisioner is showing in error state means the nfs server is not online i think i um, i think this is not the one which one we used yesterday for nfs we use docker server yes No, Docker doesn't have enough space, so I selected some other server. Which one? Is it Nexus server or what? I deleted Nexus server. Oh. So let me check. Forty eight dot two fifty one, which IP it is this is not the one. I think I deleted that mission. I think I used uh, this one Nexus server. <coughs> Just now, before starting the session, I deleted these unnecessary servers. Um, Again, I need to create NFS server and I need to is it okay instead of doing all these things it's very simple as I said just uh, we can create the pod and this pod can able to use this uh, volume that's it okay 
so again if i need to unnecessary time will be wasted create an fs server again redeploy this all this thing instead of that only the pending is how the pod is going to uh, use that pvc so that is same how we practiced previously so we change the file here so here what are the volume you created that volume pvc you need to give inside this uh, manifest file that's it so this is about uh, the volumes okay so now we talk about the real thing okay till now we were discussing about the components or objects of the kubernetes like what is pod what is a, a network in the kubernetes and uh, different uh, resources like uh, how we deploy the application that called deployment uh, and a stateful set daemon set and the services we discussed load balancer right? and uh, node port cluster ip and some other uh, objects like node selector lot of different uh, objects we discussed till now and uh, the important is the volumes kubernetes volumes okay these are we are learning the objects but if you are a devops engineer and in your organization and uh, they decided to move the applications or we should migrate the applications to deploy on the kubernetes cluster instead of virtual machines assume previously they were deploying it on the virtual machines now they decided to deploy it on the kubernetes cluster then how you are going to deploy those applications how it will work in the real time that we'll discuss now okay so now we individually discussed about each topic okay but now whenever see the developers writing the code till now what was happening so it is going to be uh, code checking is going to be done to the source code management and uh, this is a source code management and from here whenever the check-in happens what it will do jenkins will pick up the code right and uh, Jenkins will clone the code and it will do build right it will do the build and uh, then it will copy that artifact var file inside the artifactory whether it can be nexus or whether it can be artifactory or whether it can be any cloud environment like ACR GCR or uh, ECR okay so here it is going to store from here by using this artifactory we are de will deploy it to the some environment virtual machine environment whether it can be cloud environment or whether it can be uh, on premises environment we can deploy this application over here right now when it decided to deploy it on the kubernetes cluster so how we are going to deploy so here whenever the developers are doing the code check-in it is coming jenkins will pick up the code so when it is deploying the applications on the if we are trying to deploy it on the kubernetes environment so assume this is a virtual machines and this is a Kubernetes cluster in case if you want to deploy here then how the scenario will be so obviously CI CD job is mandatory CI jobs will be basically based upon the code chicken means whenever a developer modifies anything in the code and he push the code if you do commit then immediately the CI job will be executed with the help of webhooks configuration so that will be compulsory whenever the developers code check in done then it is going to create a ca job execute a ca job so what contains ca job it's do integration assume this is a java application so if the java application is there 
then this java application needs uh, what first of all it needs it to clone that and uh, maven is a build tool right so what it will do it will we will write jenkins uh, pipelines so in the jenkins pipeline we'll have a stages stage one clone the repository this repository stage two execute the maven command to create an artifact and third stage push the artifact to artifactory okay this will be stages will be available and fourth stage you can notify it in the slack or uh, you can intimate okay that can be written inside this jenkins files if it is a freestyle project you can configure or else if it is a pipeline you need to write a declarative pipeline script or scripted based pipeline okay that you need to write it here so if it should be deployed into the cluster then the there should be another step will be added that is called as a building the docker image means in this ca job so the stages will be what clone okay and uh, build artifact and uh, create docker image and then push the docker image to artifactory so these are the four stages will be available we need to create it okay so because in kubernetes you are going to deploy the docker images only right we are deploying with the docker images so here prerequisite what else you need to install here apart from maven you need to install docker also inside this because to execute the docker command to create the image you should have docker installed inside this one and uh, so that it can able to create image means by using this artifact it will create an image and that image need to be pushed so images are going to store here so in the cd job cd job no need to be automatically whenever you want we want to deploy it so in the cd what you are going to use if you are deploying into the kubernetes cluster so what you are going to use this image so where you are going to use this, use this image basically we are deploying uh, some yaml files right let's say nginx maybe app.yaml so inside that kind is let's say deployment okay means we are using deployment obviously applications will be deployed with the type called deployment only and here we'll have a container specifications and inside that image will give this artifactory url wherever this image is available the image url name tag means version because whenever this image is getting created multiple images will be stored here right whenever the code checking is done it will execute this job and it will create an image and it will store here so same way here which image name you are going to provide right so this is a yaml file you are going to use but you are not going to use only the single yaml file to deploy the application in the real time that's why we have learned helm charts okay so we use helm charts mandatory you are going to use that because your single kind deployment is not going to work it needs service right it needs service deployment.yaml file to deploy the application it needs a service to access it from the external world or maybe internally the cluster communication should be there so you are going to use service.yaml maybe it's a load balancer or maybe node port and uh, apart from this this might require config maps compulsory for properties so always you no need to uh, change the code level so if anything you can want to change the properties of applications you can do it from the config map and uh, secrets to maintain the secrets and uh, in real time you configure hpa.yaml file horizontal pod autoscaler okay so like this some resources guys just give me a minute i'll be back someone is knocking the door
This conference will now be recorded. Okay, guys, I'm back. So, to deploy an application, okay, so here when we talk about Kubernetes, obviously 90% it will be microservices. So, multiple microservices will be there to have one single application. So, in our scenario, is you say 15 microservices. Okay, so this is for one of the micro service because for each microservice in the source code management it will be 15 repos will be there okay so each microservice is having separate uh, repo and developers whenever they do code check-in based upon that it will create an uh, artifactory and it will build a docker image in the ci job and uh, it will go and store in the artifactory then in the CD job, we take that image and we deploy. So like that, all the 15 microservices should be deployed. So depend upon each microservice requirement, we are going to configure the Helm chart. Means whatever the files are required, we'll keep those files inside the Helm chart, whether it's a config map, secrets, HPA, okay, uh, service deployment. These are some basic compulsory. Apart from that, many things are required like if it is volume is required persistent volume claim is required then we will create pvc.yml file okay so this way we'll have microservices will be configured and uh, in the cd job it's very simple only to deploy so this helm chart will be deployed into the cluster so this will be deployed so again this cd job is also going to be executed from jenkins so in this job we'll just execute helm install helm upgrade command and by using the helm chart location okay so this way we need to do that so to do this job your jenkins server should also configure with helm so here you are installing git maven docker and helm also should be installed because to execute helm command and we need to copy this config file cluster config file inside the jenkins server and we need to make it ready this jenkins server to deploy the applications from here to here so to do all these things we need to configure jenkins so in this today's session we will configure jenkins if uh, time permits will complete it or else tomorrow we will continue to configure this jenkins server right so after configuring this we are going to deploy the applications inside this uh, cluster so we have ci job with us and we have cd job how i have an uh, java spring boot application so i will show you how to configure that and how we do ci continuous integration and then how we can deploy that image with that image so here for artifactory i am going to use docker hub only okay so i am going to deploy these applications inside this kubernetes cluster understood right so now first i need to make sure jenkins is ready so i need to create jenkins i have a documentation for this and if you see here the first one is jenkins installation and jenkins installation in the jenkins server setup document we have a uh, maven git docker okay this three i'm going to configure it and after this uh, helm tiller configuration so on jenkins server how i'm going to configure helm i'm going to show you okay these three things are required first of all i need to install the jenkins create virtual machine install jenkins and then install git uh, maven docker and after that i'm going to install uh, configure helm okay so that this jenkins will be ready now so let me go to uh, my aws okay so now i don't want these two servers let me delete them So I'm going to take fresh server now. First Jenkins server installation. Let me see 
so here take any seven version and uh, prerequisites is java compulsory because jenkins is in java application so java software should be available and then uh, actually i did not mention here the spring boot application which i am taking here in the example there will be test cases will be available inside that software i hope you guys are aware about test cases means when developers write the code they will write the test cases also so when the jenkins job execute the ci job it will do the task of the test cases whatever has been written by the developer so at that time jenkins need more resources if your jenkins doesn't have more resources then those test cases will not complete on time or it will take lot of time to take that if your jenkins server has enough resources then what are the test cases has been written by the developers it will complete quickly so for our application also we need at least uh, 2 gb of ram okay because the uh, java application which i am using as a sample application it's a spring boot application so lot of test cases are there it will it need lot of memory so that's why i cannot use t2.micro so we need at least 2 gb ram okay that i did not mention here actually i should mention the prerequisite also take uh, another type of instance so this is uh, how to install java and how to configure uh, home path and uh, how to install uh, jenkins and then start the service okay so let me do this let me create one server launch instance before this if you see here for this t2.small is required because it's having 2 gb of ram so instant that machine i created for the previous batch running so launch instance I'm selecting Amazon Linux here. T dot micro, sorry T dot uh, small, so that I can get two GB of RAM. Configure and uh, here no need to change anything. Add storage. Add tax name. you patch jenkins how much is charge for the server charge we need to check in the calculator s3 calculator will be there right in the aws so yeah. we need to check i never check that okay okay bro maybe whenever we practice and immediately we need to shut it down again when we are doing practice power it on just maybe 10 to 20 rupees they will charge i think so So Jenkins obviously will use uh, 8080 port number, so I should allow 8080. Review and launch. The instance is launched. did you use an existing key right yes okay so this is a instance has been created take it and uh, now i'll install jenkins inside this machine
so the first thing the prerequisite is install the java okay so i am going to install the java by default java 7 will be there so we want java 1.8 version minimum In Jenkins, you need to configure um, environment variable and also you need to configure in, inside the global tool configuration, the Java path. Otherwise, it cannot, whenever you trigger any job, it cannot able to recognize the command. So Java hyphen version. So M remove Java 1.7. Yes. Even though we install 1.8, still it is showing 1.7. So I deleted it. Now it is showing 1.8 version. Fine. And uh, then we need to find uh, find the Java home, and then need to configure inside the root profile. So we can execute this find command. So USR lib JVM is a location of the Java home. We are finding the path, the full path, so that we can configure it inside the Java home. So now let me search it. So this is the path. Always remember once you go inside this one, you can able to see these directories. Okay, sometimes you can see only this directory. JDK should be available. JDK, this belongs to JDK and this is JRE. So to run Maven integration, so JDK is also mandated. Otherwise, Maven uh, build these commands will not work if the JDK is not available. Okay, so better to cross check whenever you are installing Java in Jenkins. So make sure JDK is also available. So this path I need to configure inside the roots profile. So let me go to the profile vi dot bash underscore profile. This file will be available inside the home directory of root. And uh, here we can give Java underscore home equal to the path this is the path okay and uh, the same thing we need to mention inside the path also Java underscore home export Java underscore home. So if you mention inside the profile file, then it will be permanent. On fly also we can do that command line, but it is not permanent. It will be permanent only if you mention inside the profile file. So this way we can able to configure and uh, you can execute this command so that this will apply on fly means basically when the user logs in it will read the profile and he logs in but we changed the profile now we did modification but existing connection whatever is established the shell it doesn't know what are the changes has been done to the profile so you need to log out and log in so again while logging in it will take the latest uh, profile file but Instead of doing that, you can able to execute this command. So it will refresh, reload the latest profile. Okay, you no need to log out and log in.
now we can install Jenkins and this is the way we can install Jenkins by default in uh, AWS machine we'll have duplicate command in Red Hat Linux we don't have duplicate so you can install duplicate so for me already duplicate is available so what we are doing duplicate means through web we are getting some file so in the web we are having this is a file https in the jenkins uh, url will have a repository so i hope you guys are aware about this one by default if i type let's say if i type this command m install iphone why It's not available. Why? Why it is not available? When I'm typing m install Jenkins, what it is trying to do? It will go and search in the m repository. Yeah. Yeah. So by default, whichever OS you take, right now I took AWS OS and uh, if you take Red Hat Linux, CentOS Linux, by default the OS is going to provide you some repos for you. You go inside this uh, repos, they are providing some repositories which contains this repo contains some URLs. So whenever you type yum install some package name, it will go and check in the URL of this repo. So if you see, this is a main dot repo. Here some URLs are there. So in this URL, the packages will be available. When we type yum install any package name, it will connect to this repo and it will go and contact that internet through internet. It will connect to these uh, URLs and from there it will check whether the package is available or not. If it is available, it will install. OS related software, you can get it here. But Jenkins is a another third party software. So your OS vendor is not providing you Jenkins software in there repository so for that purpose what we need to do jenkins is providing a repo so that repo should be available inside this path here so that when you type m install jenkins then it will go and check in that particular repo and then it will contact the jenkins repository into the internet and from there it will install the jenkins package so for that purpose this is a command so from internet we are downloading this file and copying inside this location this command will do that task so it is downloading this file and putting inside this jenkins.repo so let me do that so m only searches now, the inside the inside your machine not uh, going out and checking for the repository no it will not go outside whatever the default repositories are available under this present location it will check here so from internet we need to copy to that repository so that you can use the yum later yeah okay so now when i type yum <coughs> install then it will come and check in the jinkies repository here okay but so Pravin, if you, if you do, if you do M, hmm. hello, Pravin, if you do M install updates, yeah. uh, means it will go outside, right? M install, no updates, updates. Everything it will check. See, first it will contact the repo. In the repo, there will be URLs will be there. Then it will go hmm. and contact that URL to get the packages. Okay, okay. When you're typing M any package name or M upgrade, whatever you're typing, it will come and check in this repos. So it will contact this repos and if any update packages are available, then it will go and connect to that URLs and from there it will pull the latest uh, softwares. Directly it will not go to the URLs. How come it knows the URL? Those URLs are available inside the repos. So right yeah. now this Jenkins.repo file is also copied here and if you see this is a URL here it contains the uh, Jenkins software. So when I type BM install now then it will connect to this URL and from there it will download. So now after this 
import the key now we can use m install now it can connect and it can able to uh, Pravin, what is this key this key is for jenkins to work from here okay. in the same path we are downloading this key so that jenkins can able to work <laughs> It's, it's a standard now, one across the internet, right? Yes. Okay. So now we can start uh, service Jenkins status. It's in stop state. Start it. And make sure it is permanently on, on the run level three and five. So done now it is fine so now we need to access it by its ip with 880 port number so let me go and take the public ip of this machine and uh, need to get the password so copy the password from this location Cat. so this is the password so the why jenkins is famous because it supports lots of plugins that's the reason even though we have many tools uh, most of the companies use Jenkins because uh, it have a lot of plugin support so here it is suggesting do we want to uh, install plugins which we are selected or they are going to suggest some plugins default plugins you want to go with that so as of now I'm not interested to select by myself to install the plugins let it go by suggested plugins So when we select this some default plugins get installed see for every jenkins version they will add new plugin inside the installation process previously they were installing only few default plugins but every time they having new version they need to have a they are adding one more plugin extra like few plugins they are adding inside this installation procedure very quickly it's completed it is asking to create any user account so i am going to create admin or maybe i am going to create with my name so give some information so this is the url to access this jenkins yes save and finish so start using Jenkins. So yesterday we were uh, creating Jenkins server for the prerequisites to do the continuous integration and the deployment on the Kubernetes cluster. So for that purpose, we are creating a Jenkins server and yesterday we created it and today we are going to install the prerequisite software like a Git uh, Maven and um, Docker, and then we need to configure it with the Helm. Okay, so I don't think we need the servers as of now. So let me power down this cluster. Okay, so let me log into this uh, Jenkins.
So in this repository, if you see Jenkins installation is completed. Now Jenkins server setup. Okay, this is a thing we are going to configure now. So the first basic thing is Git. So why we need Git? Because whenever the code chicken happens, if we configure continuous integration, or even though manually if you are trying to trigger a job, it will connect to the source code GitHub and it will clone the repository to clone it needs git command compulsory right that's why we need to install git so this is the step to install uh, git docker and uh, maven so it's very simple yum install git it will install the git so first let me go and do with this apache okay so as I said, duplicate is already available in the AWS Linux command. So if you are using Red Hat Linux, then you should install duplicate and even in CentOS also. But Amazon Linux, you don't need to install duplicate. So this is a tar file we can able to download for the Maven. And before that, let me go into the OPT. There I will download it. So it's getting downloaded. Now it's done. Then we need to extract it. The next command is extract. Use the tar command, tar xvzf and the tar file it will extract and it will create a directory so once it is extracted then you can remove the old uh, the tar file because it's already extracted and we can see this is a directory so inside this apache maven will be there and now we need to configure home path inside the maven home path inside the profile so for that we need to be inside the home directory of uh, root and uh, here open this bash underscore profile and uh, you can give it below java okay m2 underscore home equal to the path this is a path right so it will be slash opt slash m2 equal to dollar dollar m2 underscore home slash bin to get the bin and same thing we need to give it here dollar m2 then only maven command will work okay otherwise always you need to go inside the opt and the uh, apache maven path and then you need to execute the command so without uh, saving this i'll open another session to show you that the difference so the command will be available if we configure like how we are executing all the commands because they are configured under the profile that's the reason we can able to execute all the commands we don't need to go to the specific uh, path like if you see which clear it is inside the usr bin clear the command but we are not going into that location we can able to execute in whatever path you are why because it is configured inside the path uh, profile file right same way now if we say maven you cannot able to execute maven command but if you go opt apache bin directory here we can see binaries here you can able to execute okay that tool this way it will work maven command is executed so always i it's very tough to go to the path and we need to execute it right? that's why we configure profile so now if you see here 
just i'm going to save this and uh, source bash underscore profile sorry dot now if i type mvn i can able to execute where i am right now in the root i am i did not go to the slash opt apache map and i can able to execute mvn command that's why we need to configure why because when you are cloning the code the second stage is build the code to build the code mvn command will be executed mvn uh, clean all mvn clean install okay these are the commands lot of uh, mvn commands are available so it will be get executed so that's why the mvn command should be ex able to execute if you don't configure where uh, this one environment variable then your job jenkins job will fail just stating that mvn command not found now this is also done install git it's very simple git is available uh, in the default repository yum install git hyphen y so git is also available check the command yes it's available now docker as i said why we are installing docker the third stage first clone will be there second build will be done once build is done it will create a jar or var file because if you are taking java application jar or var file with the jar or var file we are going to create a docker image then with the docker image then we are fourth stage is push the docker image to some artifactory right so for to do that to build the docker image you should have docker command docker build hyphen t that command should be executed and uh, the docker file so that we need to have the docker command so yum install docker you need to make sure by default the service will be in stop state you need to start and make sure that is on on the boot time so service uh, docker status service docker start chk config docker on done it's available now now docker is also running now uh, what we need to do for jenkins user if whenever we install jenkins in linux machine by default if you see in the cat etc password the jenkins user account will be created so whenever you are executing the jobs those jobs will be executed with the user called jenkins okay so when you are executing any job so that is getting executed why because if you see where lib jenkins this is the home directory of jenkins user account so i'm not sure whether you guys practice jenkins so you have idea about jenkins i'm not sure if you are practice jenkins so whenever you configure any job the workspace directory will be available inside this varlib jenkins directory under that it will create a directory called the job name whatever the job you created and the results will be available over there right so now also you are going to use the same jenkins user means whenever you trigger a job it will be automatically by default jenkins user account so by default it is showing false means jenkins cannot able to with the jenkins user you cannot able to log in let's see if i type can you able to see i cannot able to log into jenkins user account why because shell is not available for jenkins by default but for us to execute docker build command okay we need jenkins user should have the shell should be there so that's why what we are going to do we are going to assign shell to the jenkins user account so for this i am going to modify vi etc password then uh, we'll change it to the bash okay we are giving shell 
now if i type jenkins sorry let's see how fun jenkins now i can able to log in with the jenkins user account okay so you need to change the jenkins this is mentioned here essential to jenkins user from bin falls to bin bash now provide permissions to jenkins user in jenkins server to access docker basically as a root user you can able to execute docker commands docker create docker build everything but jenkins is a normal user to give him access so we need to follow these steps first of all you check whether docker group is there or not so let me check cat etc group already docker group is there so i no need to create now what we are going to do we are going to add jenkins user inside the docker group so that jenkins is going to get permission to access the docker okay <coughs> if you see as a jenkins user if i am typing docker ps got permission denied while trying to connect to the docker daemon okay socket at this one so we need to give permission to this one so first if you see here first we are adding the jenkins user inside the docker group so let me not is it then and uh, giving the full permission to this file so that jenkins can able to access this var run docker okay now if you see jenkins user can able to execute docker then only can able to execute docker build command and a docker push command to push the image to the nexus repository so docker commands can be able to execute and um, apart from this we need to give sudo permission to the jenkins user account so for that that is not mentioned i missed to define inside this document so you need to remember you need to give sudo access to the jenkins user account why because why you need to give uh, when you are using helm the next configuration which i'm going to show you the helm setup at that time it needs sudo access okay so vi etc sudoers go here below the root here all and you know no password that's so you we have given sudo access also for jenkins user account in the jenkins user now the next document we need to follow is helm jenkins setup helm so now jenkins server set up with helm to deploy into the kubernetes cluster so what we are going to do it here download and install helm so why we need helm we already discussed here oh, no. i think that has been deleted so yesterday we have downloaded it why is all this this is hiding anyone know where is the top option to view so this is our jenkins server and uh, this is the source code 
and the developers write the code right so to see a job to run the CA job we required git maven docker these are the things required for CI job because clone it build it with maven command create docker image and push the docker image to the nexus repository but cd job it required so if this is a cluster and these are the nodes for cd job from the jenkins you need helm so he why because helm command will be executed from here in the helm class i have shown you right uh, helm install i install some packages by sitting in one linux machine it's a just linux machine but here in this scenario jenkins we create a job and the same command will be executed here so helm command will be executed from this machine so that it will go and deploy on this machines that's the reason we are installing helm inside this one for this is for cd and this is for ci okay so the prerequisite helm is also need to be installed now this is a command to install helm package so local in the present path itself i'm in downloading this helm package and we can see okay get this is a package and now we are changing the permission why because there is no executive permission here so that we cannot able to execute it so if we give seven then we'll get uh, execute permission so that we can able to execute it and this way see if you just execute this one also it will work okay but it will execute the latest version sometimes the recommendation is maybe latest versions may not be compatible so if you are want to install with the specific version then you need to give iphone v the version which version you are preferred so that version you can give Okay, so give that version. Helm install. Okay, Helm has been installed. Check Helm. Yes, it is installed. Now, if you check the Helm version, authentication is required. You are authenticated as anonymous permission. You do not have, but okay, client version it is showing server version it is not showing why because still it is not connected to any uh, cluster environment okay so now copy config file from kubernetes master to jenkins home directory so whatever the file was there now i need to power on the master machine so that i can copy why because how this Jenkins server know we have a cluster and it should go and deploy there. You need to copy that config file here. Then only it will have access to go and access the cluster. So now to copy the config file, let me power on the machine. Once uh, it is powered on, we need to copy the uh, admin.conf file under this location. This is the default home directory of Jenkins. Under this, we need to create .cube directory and copy that. After that, these components should be created inside the <coughs> Kubernetes cluster. I think these are already created. So what I'm going to do, let us create a
Okay, so let us create in the Google Cloud new cluster instead of using the I think we don't require three, two are enough. And uh, which nodes they are providing, not auto scaling is required. Nodes series is eight to two CPUs, four GB RAM. Okay. Okay. Okay, let me create this one. Basically in AKS, whenever you create any resource, it will take uh, time compared to AWS and Google Cloud. It will take time, even if we want to create AKS cluster also, it will take time, okay? So I thought instead of using the AWS environment, the bare metal, I thought to create this GKE cluster so that we can use uh, this cluster to deploy the applications, okay? So once it is done, then we need to create this um, tiller component inside that, as I said, this is a Helm version two I'm using. So tiller component, uh, we need to create inside the cluster. And uh, for tiller, we are going to create some cluster role. As I said yesterday, we are giving authority to tiller to do the activity because whenever here tiller component will be created, so tiller is the responsible to deploy. Whenever we are deploying from Helm, it will in, intimate to the tiller. So tiller will take care and deploy the application. So to do that, it should have the access, means authority to do that, right? So that's why we are creating service account, cluster role binding, all these things. So that tiller can able to access the cluster and it can able to create whatever it want because a lot of components we are trying to create with the Helm chat. So it, may, it may be config map, secrets, and uh, deployments, volumes, anything. So tiller should have access, authority to do that. So that's why we are creating this and providing it to the tiller. Service account, cluster role binding, okay. And after doing that, creating when I execute helm init iPhone and service account tiller, then this you need to be executed from the Jenkins server. So when we are just first we copied the admin.con file to Jenkins and then we created service account cluster role binding here. Then when I execute helm init initialization, it will go and contact the tiller and it will deploy a pod. So the pod will take care of the deployments, whatever you deploy through Jenkins server. Like yesterday, same like yesterday, NFS client provisioner, how it was working, same way. From here, Helm, when you're deploying, then Tiller will take care, this pod will take care to deploy the applications. Okay, so that is how it will work. Let me see whether it has been created or not. Still, it is taking time. And after this, I think we have one more document Helm Tiller configuration. What is it? Okay, so here I mentioned um, sudoers, vi etc sudoers file, Jenkins all. So anyhow, we are enabling all the ports. So, but in real time, if specific port, if you want to enable, then you should enable this 10250 because Helm is trying to contact 
to the cluster to 10250 port. Okay, this is also the same. So I think two times it is mentioned. Only this is uh, additional configuration is there, and this, this page and the previous page both are same. Okay, so it's good help minute and this one. Once it is done, then only we can able to access the cluster. Yep, it's done. Now connect. Run in Cloud Shell. Even this cloud shell you will get in the AKS also, but not in the AWS. Azure and yeah, Azure also is very useful. Yeah, in Azure also we'll get cloud shell, but yeah. in AWS you don't get cloud shell. Yeah, only CLI. Yeah. One quick question earlier. Uh... In the Jenkins pipeline, when we mm. when we build the Docker image, are we going to push it to Docker Hub or Nexus repository? It's up to you. Whatever you configure your artifactory. Okay. So in our scenario, I was using Docker Hub. If you have oh. Nexus or JFrog, then you can push it to there also. Okay, got you. So this is a command we are executing now. Uh, Okay, so that what it will do even in cloud shell this cloud shell is they are giving some separate shell So that you can instead of creating some other virtual machine to access your cluster They are giving you a shell so that you can able to execute commands, but that cloud shell doesn't have your config file So this command will copy the config file in this present location If you see this dot cube directory gets created now after executing this command, then it will copy that config file. So now I'm going to use same directory here. And uh, this is the config cat config. So I will copy from here. Let me see. So this is the Jenkins server CD. So I should log in as a Jenkins user or normal root user also you can do, but again you need to change the permissions. So whenever the Jenkins user logs in by default, it's the this is the home directory. So here I'm creating dot cube and uh, so we should go inside the cube. And VI config. So here till here I was copied. So remaining lines I'm copying. Why it is not able to copy the complete?
so copied complete uh, configuration okay done and uh, then once it is copied so previous one is i think good one jenkins setup helm so once it is copied then we need to create a tiller service account inside the this is called object called service account so we need to create it in the cloud shell i'm executing it oh. last time also we faced the same issue Cube City Life One, and this is a namespace. Service account tiller. Raju, your screen is not visible. Are you shrinking? Something happened. Okay, let me share once again. Can you able to see now? Yes. okay so i create executed this command i cannot able to copy i forgot there there is a process to uh, copy and paste okay this way i think so control v so now i created service account now i'm going to create uh, cluster role binding and the cluster role for tiller so this is a command i'm executing so cluster role binding and cluster role has been created and uh, the next is this is a command so initialization before this if i show you kubectl get parts hyphen n cube hyphen system here you don't see <coughs> any tiller part available and even if you see kubectl get deployment hyphen n in the namespace cube hyphen system namespace you don't see any tiller component right so now when i execute uh, this one in the jenkins server so i am executing this in the jenkins server so what it will do it will go and contact to the um, cluster and it will deploy so where is my jenkins server this is my jenkins server let me do that installing unknown post deployments adding local repo installing unknown post deployments you don't need to point to that cluster information or anything because you are in aws uh, virtual machine yes we copied the config file right uh, okay sir so, that's why we copied the config file to the jenkins home directory but let me see what is the ip is there inside that maybe the config file is not copied properly that is a problem more yep the config file is not copied properly hmm
okay i think now it's having full information more config yep so this is a, a cluster public ip so this will connect to this ip means the ap call will send to the cluster the master server of this uh, gke cluster so okay. now so let me execute the same hell minute command so, so that it will connect to the cluster and it will create the deploy the tiller deployment. We'll see. Uh, could not get Kubernetes client, could not get config for loading config file. Oh, could not find expected line number six. Problem is Let's configure context. There is a problem. It says line number six, but Uh, Pravin, can we download this uh, uh, config file to your local machine? I think no, we cannot uh, if it download is it. How about the SCP command? <laughs> yeah, we can use SCP. Mm, we need to have the public IP of this one 126 165 six. SCP config mm, EC2 hyphen user red 100 dot 26 dot 165 dot 106. But before that, <clears throat> we need to enable password authentication here. So V I E T C S S H S S H T. Yes. 
and uh, service SST restart and then assign password ec2 hyphen user giving the password and then from here i can execute it the password which i gave just now okay it's copied cd temp config file chmod777 config and move config file to where lib jenkins under dot q yes overwrite now if i log into jenkins and if i go to cube directory so it's having actually easy to use our owner but i give 777 permission so not a problem so now let me see again to execute helm command yep okay tiller the helm has been installed into your kubernetes cluster the tiller component if i go and see here clear kubectl get pods hyphen in in the namespace of cube system you see 18 seconds ago tiller component has been deployed okay this uh, is under the brief what did you do yeah kubectl get deployment hyphen n cube hyphen system and uh, if you see this is a deployment the type deployment how the pod got deployed because the kind deployment has been deployed here when i execute this command so i was trying to uh, copy the config file because of this cloud shell i cannot able to copy the um, content of this uh, config file to my jenkins home directory okay so that's why what i have done i copied the config file from the cloud shell from the cloud shell to my jenkins server how i copied with the scp command but by default aws machines will not accept password based based authentication right it will accept only key based authentication so always whenever i'm trying to login in how i'm trying to log in by attaching the key so if you are using scp then i cannot able to log in because when i execute this command scp command here this command obviously it will to which from which user you are trying to access we need to give that user account so this is the command so i have ec2 user inside my jenkins server but when i execute this it will ask password but password is not enabled so in this linux machine in the jenkins server we need to enable password based authentication for that you need to go to etc ssh sshd underscore config under this location we have an option called password authentication by default it will be no so i made it yes so that remotely even now from putty also i can able to log in let's say uh, if i open a new session now i don't need to give always key 100.26.165.106 okay now i'm giving ec to user previously i used to give key now i can give password i no need to attach any key now so if i click okay it will ask me password See, it is asking password the password which i provided secure my store password my master password okay it is asking some uh, complexity so let ignore it so here i can able to log in now with the password now i can do sudo means instead of key based authentication we can use uh, password based authentication also i enable that feature and 
but I don't know what is the password of easy to user provided by the AWS. So that's why I have done reset that password with the password command password easy to iPhone user if I execute this command then I able to reset the password. So when I executed this command here, it was asking me the password. So what are the password I have done reset there? I gave that password. So this config file copied from cloud shell to my Jenkins server under the temp location and from there I copied I can it to the Jenkins home directory. Okay, then I executed helm command. It got created. Now if you see here. Uh, so tiller component is up and running now fine. So this will help us to deploy any applications from the Jenkins server. Understood, right? Yes, yes. So the copying is not happening properly. Otherwise, we don't need to do all these things. Maybe some mistakes are happening while copying it. That's why the exact file we copied from the cloud shell to um, our Jenkins machine. So if it is not an uh, AWS machine, then it's very simple. In that machine, you will have any user account and password. So you copy this config file to that location. Here you need to give that username. Let's say if you are using any virtual machine, your own virtual machine, you have one with your name or any name you have a one user account. Then give that username here, and when you execute this, it will ask password, and you enter the password. Okay, what are the password you have? Simply it will work. Because of this AWS password authentication is not enabled. That's why I made enable and then I have reset the password of uh, ECT user so that I can know the password. Then I executed this. So temp means it will go and store in the temp from there wherever you want later on you can, can move from that server. Okay. 